is April 24th, 2013. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University Library and I'm here in Oklahoma City at News 9 station to hear from Gary England, Oklahoma's top rated television meteorologist. Mm -hmm. And this is part of our Spotlighting Oklahoma series. So thank you for having me today. I appreciate you being here. <laughs> Let's start with learning a little bit about you, uh, your childhood, when and where you were born, and we'll work our way forward. Okay. I was born and raised, uh, born near Sealing, Oklahoma, a little yellow house out uh, just east of town. And then ra was raised most of my years in Sealing, Oklahoma, that's the northwestern part of the state. Population then was about a thousand. They claim it's still a thousand, but it's not. I've I lived a couple of years, uh, I think the first and second grade in Enid, Oklahoma, and then moved back and spent the rest of my growing up years in Sealing, Oklahoma. And uh, those were the good times. <laughs> And you graduated from high school there? Graduated from high school, the ceiling high school in 1957. I was on the football team, wasn't very good. Fortunately, a lot of people didn't go out for football, so I got to play halfback some. Uh, played football and basketball, ran in track. Uh, you know, I wasn't really good in school, and uh, I, I was never interested, but I finally got interested. But through high school, I didn't too much. But I remember I had one teacher, George Purvine, great guy. And George, I mean, he, he, he just, I don't know, something about that as a teacher. I never really appreciated teachers most of my life, really until I got on television, but George was one I appreciated. He worked with me and he gave me so much encouragement. He'd come and say, he'd say, Gary, I expect you someday to do something great. You may be a, you may be like governor of Oklahoma. I mean, he always planted those things. So I had him and uh, my mom and dad. My dad uh, ran a, uh, ran a, uh, ice route in those days early on I don't remember the ice route but they tell me he ran an ice route and, and delivered ice and cubes to places out in the country at the ceiling then he he uh, ran a creamery where they, they bring in the, the farmers bring in the the milk and they get the cream and the milk all separated they brought in the eggs and all the chickens and I was very young obviously a year old or less, less than that we lived in that in that creamery and that creamery part of it was a part of an old bank and then the place where we lived was basically, basically we all slept in this one room. It was a, it was an old concrete vault from a bank that they'd kind of torn down and that was part of the place. And so we lived there, for, I don't know how long we lived there. But dad did that uh, and he was pretty good at it. And, uh, he, he was always, my dad was always kind of an entrepreneur. When we were in Enid, he, he developed, uh, he got in, got a bus route. I mean, he, bought the, he and another guy bought a bus. They were gonna start a bus company. He was, and, he, and for a while he owned a gas station. And Dad, I think, had an eighth grade education, but he was always trying to do better. None of those things ever worked. And I'm a senior, uh, I guess I'm a senior in high school, and I was like all kids, you know, love to drive fast, and, you know, in, in those days, you know, fast was probably about 60 miles an hour. <laughs> but uh, Dad got, Dad's running that bread route, and I'd have to go with him ever. Uh, when I was in school every Saturday and every Saturday and, and, and dad loved to talk. We'd go out through western Oklahoma and stop at all those little towns and take the bread in and he'd just talk and talk and I always wanted to get back and be with my friends. But uh, he got the, the, well they had a big drought and he lost the bread route. So he, he didn't have a job for a while so he worked uh, basically as a, uh, uh, well he, he swept up the parts store there in the ceiling took care of that. And then I joined the service and Dad got a chance, he'd always wanted to be in the grocery business, and he got a chance to buy into a grocery store, and that was about 1956 or 50, about 57, and he made a big success out of it. But all the time I was there in school, you know, he had, just like so many people in those days, they had trouble. And uh, Mom, uh, she worked at the, another grocery store across the street, and she was a checker, and she did great. And she worked at a, a jean factory in Woodward. They used to make blue jeans in Woodward, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and she'd drive up there and work. Uh, my older brother Richard. Richard uh, Richard's ten years older than me, and uh, Rip was uh, you'd never guess. Rip was just tough as a junkyard dog. And one day, my dad, cause my brother, started running a route too while he was still in high school. And he'd drive. He would go from ceiling. He'd take bread to Woodward, and my dad would continue this other route. Well, one morning, my daddy and another guy, a bond bread salesman, got in a fight in ceiling because. The bond bread salesman got to one of the restaurants and moved all the dad's buns away and put his in there. So they had this discussion and they had this fist fight. I guess it was, I didn't see it, 4 a.m. in the morning, 4 a.m. ceiling Oklahoma on me and out on, in the middle of the street. 
But the, the, the bond bread salesman was bigger than my dad, so he got the best of my dad. So my young, my older brother, when he got back in that bread route and found out about that, he found that bond bread salesman. And my, by the way, my uh, my uncle ran a hardware store there, and my older brother knocked that bond bread salesman right through the window of that <laughs> store. <laughs> but it'd be and, and, uh, Richard, my older brother's most wonderful person, and he's a he's a caregiver. He's a great person, but boy, he he was something else. Then I got an older sister who always tried to take care of me. I'd get in trouble. I remember one time, I was always in trouble. And uh, the, pr the principal came in, the superintendent came into the room where I was, fifth grade, and said, uh, Gary, had you been out in the shop over the weekend? You know, you make things. And I said, no. And he said, well, someone's taking all the tools and throwing them and they're stuck in the wall down. And he just automatically thought it was me. So then my sister finds out about it, and then she... She gets a hold of the superintendent, and she always protected me. She went to him and really explained to him how it worked. She was great. I got a younger brother that's 10 years younger than me, and great kid. I hope I didn't mislead him too much, but I've had a great family. Sounds like it. We used to have those Christmases at home, and we all go down to Grandma's. In those days, you know, there, there must have been, I don't know how many adults, but there were just kids everywhere. It was so exciting, and, and we'd, in those days, we'd, we'd open one gift on Christmas Eve and save the rest of them. Of course, about two gifts, and that was it. But there were just kids everywhere, cousins and nephews and uncles. And my mother, my, my grandma Stong, my mother's mother, they were so close to the same age that my dad and my granddad and the two of them would go to dances together. And, uh, and so, therefore, they were almost the same age. So a lot of my, my uncles are almost the same age as me. But the closest one to me was uh, three years older than me, and so was, I ran around with my uncles and cousins, and it was, it was great times. Did your grandparents have a farm then, or did they have? Uh, my grandparents, no, let me tell you, both my grand on both sides, they had grandparents make the run. I, I mean, they were great grandparents, and neither one of them worked out well. Uh, they had one on the, it was on the Stong side, my mother's side. They were farmers from back east. Or no, they weren't farmers. They wanted to be farmers, so they made whichever run it was, and they settled near the Glass Mountains near Fairview, which is all rock and stone, and couldn't grow much wheat there. Uh, they left that land, let it go, and later someone discovered oil on it. <laughs> uh, the other ones, I don't know what happened to their land, but they made run, claimed some land, but just, you know, didn't try to be that day. So I never had, uh, there was not a lot of what, what a lot of people consider success, but they all raised great families with lots of kids. And uh, great Christmases, great Thanksgiving. Grandma made, Grandma Stone made little tiny silver, all, they were called silver dollar pancakes, just about that size. And she'd be feeding maybe 15 kids. And she did, and she was short, she was five foot two, if, if that, and fairly large round, and she was just wonderful. She'd laugh and go on, we'd all go down there, we'd always go down there to eat. She'd just cook those, those, uh, those pancakes. God, it was great, great time. But on both sides, you know, they were just average folks. So in high school, what was your favorite subject? Uh, None of them, huh? Well, you know, not too many of them. I, you know, I love sports, but uh, uh, and the football coach, you know, all four years, which was a football coach we had, they always taught algebra, so I didn't learn any math because they, they always wrote football plays. On the, on the, that's all they did. But uh, I guess my favorite was, it was kind of like English composition. George Purvine uh, taught that, and uh, that was great. I, I love the science. Uh, class was great, and he had lots of things pickled and all that. It made it really fascinating. But I, uh, I always wanted to be in weather, you know. I, was, uh, I, I didn't know, you know, anything about it. But anyway, yes, what, what, I, what I, in school it was that that English composition and the science class and girls, you know, girls were always the interest to me. Well, when you graduated, did you plan to go to college or at that you know, point? My, uh, my older brother. I always told me, Gary, you got to go to college, you got to go to college. And I was a little bit wild and, you know, pretty independent and and uh, got out of high school. And I'm, I'm going to think, oh, well, I may I will go to college. And so my brother, I didn't tell him, but my brother comes from OU. And there's some kind of message here. He comes from OU where he's working on his master's, I believe it was, in uh, geophysical engineering. And uh, he drives to Sealing, Oklahoma, picks me up, and drives me to Stillwater. Now, why would he do that? Why would he come from OU, take me to Stillwater? He want me in the same town with him. No, but so he took me over, and we pre-enrolled. I don't know what month that was. Uh, pre-enrolled, you know, and they, they offered some meteor, uh, meteorology class or two then. And I was excited. Went back home, and typical of a kid, I was still 17 years old. 
my, two of my buddies come up and say, hey, we've joined the Navy. And I said, well, when are you going to sign up? They said, we're going, you know, whatever day it was. I said, I'll go with you. So I uh, went over with them. They signed up. I got the stuff, came back. My mom signed the papers, and I joined the Navy at uh, seven, yeah, it was 17, yeah. So, and, then, and my brother had already spent some of his money to pre enroll me. <laughs> <laughs> but I needed to be in the service. I needed the discipline. So you were in the Navy for two years, four years? Uh, two years, 11 months, 22 days. Uh, and while in defense of my country, you know, taking weather observations, uh, that's the only reason I really joined is they promised I'd go to weather school. So I did that, but uh, two years, 11 months, 22 days, and I, you know, I'd had enough of that stuff, you know. And they said, and in I had seen all the movies in those days. They had these beautiful movies, and there, there was always music. And there'd be a sailor, and he's dressed blues. He's a little white, called a cover, like white hat on, and the blue dress blues, bell bottom, you know, and thirteen button. Oh, I see that movie. You know, they'd, they'd say a guy walking down the street, and he'd have a girl on each hand or each arm. And I quickly found out it didn't work that way, because I get sent uh, after I went to basic at at, at uh, San Diego. They sent me to Fallon, uh, they sent me to Beeville, Texas, where I was in a, 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 a mess cook. I peeled potatoes and made pies and stuff for three months. Then they sent me to Norman, which is an aviation preparatory school. And I think they kicked me off a 30-foot tower. You had to learn to jump off that and, you know, get your rigging undone. And I began, at that point, I began to think, I don't think, I'm not sure I really want to do this. But anyway, then they finally got to Lakehurst, New Jersey, went to weather school. And... Uh, so that was kind of, and from there I went on to Fallon, Nevada, okay? I suppose that I did well in that school. First time in my life I did well. I was number three in my class. I got a choice of duty stations. I listed three air, aircraft carriers. They sent me to Fallon, Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> and after a year there, they sent me to Midway Island for a year. And for a year there, I was out. Two years, 11 months, 22 days. I got out a little bit early. It was called, I was called a kitty cruiser because I joined before I was uh, 21. And so I got out an early out of service to go to college. And then that was OU, not back to OSU. Well, at OSU, when I got out, they didn't Amen. offer weather again. So went down to OU. Actually, I, actually, when I first got out of the service, I went to Southwestern State. Still wild, still crazy. Really believed in Colorado Kool-Aid. And uh, that's where I met my wife to be. And uh, we were getting ready for the homecoming. And all the kids were working on the float, of course. I. I guess I was out, outside directing traffic, but I saw this cute little redhead come out of that building where the float was, walk right down the street and stop and turn right between the two cars where I was. And I was standing there with my date. It was a girl from Tologa, Oklahoma. And, but this little redhead came in and walked right by and she kind of paused and I just reached over and grabbed her and kissed her. And my date slapped me and so I kissed Mary again and that's how I met her. I didn't know who she was. And a few days later I found out who she was and uh, we, you know, we had a a stormy relationship because I was kind of wild and kind of crazy and you know want to go here and do that and not study. I never studied. Uh, so but Southwestern was fascinating. I'll tell you one quick story. I don't know whether you put this in any history or not, but I had a buddy I lived with. He was a gold, you remember Golden Glove Boxers? It was boxing. And he was a big tall kid, kind of skinny but big and tall and he was a champion. And so I needed a tall guy because we had this ladder and there, uh, you know, in those days they locked the girls up. Do you know that? 10.30, 10.35, they locked the girls up. I've since decided they should have locked the boys up at that time. <laughs> but let me tell you, so uh, uh, I go, we go down there, he and I, my buddy, and we get this ladder behind this house. And we take it over to the girls' dorm and slap it up and I crawl up there and beat on the window and try to get Mary to come to the window. She never came to the window. She was such a prude. And all of her roommates they try to get me away. Well, one night we couldn't find the ladder. So we go on over to the dorm, and, and Harry says, he's from Wichita Falls, Harry says, I'll be your ladder. I said, okay. So I take my shoes off, and he squats down, and I get on his shoulders and stand up. And I still can't quite get that. And I can just get my arm up like this. And I finally got an arm, and I'm tiptoeing on his shoulders, and, I'm, and they're all trying to run me away. And the campus police came around the corner. And uh, they hit us with a spotlight, and I'll never forget my best friend Harry ran out from under me. <laughs> so uh, I left I left Southwestern right after that about two days later <laughs> and uh, got into OU. My brother got me enrolled you know and helped me get enrolled and uh, and uh, I was there f six months, four months, what it was, four months maybe, walked out. I don't like this, uh, you know. 
because I was in love and she was in Weatherford. So I just walked out. Thank heaven, my older brother went over and unenrolled me or whatever the term was in those days, did it, did it properly. And so then like the next year I came back, I was married, I came back and he got me, he got me enrolled again. Good guy. Good guy. Uh, so I went to OU. Uh, in, when I started, they had a, a PhD program in meteorology. They had they were starting they had a master's program. They didn't have masters, but we were all in the school of engineering physics. Meteorology at OU is a different animal. It's extremely complex, extremely difficult. It's a nightmare. As they train you to be a scientist, and all these kids that see all these programs, they go down there and they want to be a, a, a meteorologist, but they don't realize they train them to be scientists, and, and, and there's a, it's a totally different world. But so anyway, I got a degree in math and meteorology, and got out of there in 1965. Uh, Mary and I just happy as two little pups, you know. We didn't have, we didn't have a penny, uh, but I, I'd always heard that you know what you do, you go to college and you get out of college and you start your own business and you become rich. <laughs> so a couple of the guys and I, guys and I put in Oklahoma's first private weather service. Found it didn't work that way. You know, we were there about two years, didn't make any money, and then and Mary and I found out we we're going to have a baby. So I got. Yeah, I gotta get a real job. So I called a guy in New Orleans, uh, Age Glenn and Associates, and I was just going through the boat and trying to find a job because I knew I had to have a job. I wouldn't make it any money. And uh, and anyway, he answered. Long story short, went down there and he hired me. And I was down there four years. And uh, he was uh, he was a brilliant, brilliant guy. He had taken meteorology, oceanography, and civil engineering, and all of it, melted all of this incredible business. Most countries in the world, except the communist countries, most countries in the world that had a shoreline were his clients. All the offshore petroleum, all the offshore construction were his clients. So he taught me to do forecasting and civil engineering studies for when if you're going to put a rig in a certain location, it's a certain depth, the waves are a certain force, how high then a hundred year storm, bottom pressure, and all this. He taught me all this stuff, man. It was great stuff. But how he was me. He, uh, he I get, I'm sure he just didn't like putting up with young whippersnappers that come in, you know. And so uh, I worked for him, covered a lot of great storms. I was there during Hurricane Camille, and I watched him do that. It was just amazing. He, the storms coming in, and he really was the first one ever started doing probabilities on where the hurricane was going to go. And uh, he and he would just sit there. We'd do the maps up and analyze them for him, and he'd just sit there and concentrate. And he'd say, "Okay, and he'd do, give it 25% here, 30% here." He was truly, truly an amazing individual. At the time, I couldn't stand him, but I realized later I never would have been successful if I hadn't gone in and gone to work for him. So he, uh, with with Camille, he did all this, and it was tiring. You know, that was a he ended up killing 300 people or 400, whatever it was. It was, it was a monster, much worse than Katrina as far as power and all that, but it's coming up uh, between the Yucatan Peninsula and Cuba, coming, you know, it's just like, this like, it's coming right at us. And he's, he's doing this stuff, and we're, we're calling all the information out, and it gets to be about 9 o'clock that night, he gets out a cot, puts it there on the floor, gets a bottle of vodka, has a couple glasses of vodka, lays down and goes to sleep. And I'm going, there's a hurricane coming, and he's gone to sleep! <laughs> and so, uh, we had amazing individuals. So we spent four years down there. We had Molly while we were there. Uh, she was born in 68, and Molly Michelle. And in those days, uh, like when we first got down to New Orleans, uh, we didn't have any money. But the people that worked there, this Wellman, I think that was his name, but anyway, some of the people that, inter that lived there, they, uh, Selma, and anyway, they invited us to their house to dinner. And we get over and we had red beans and rice. Oh boy, these people are really poor. <laughs> I feel like that's a wonderful dish in Louisiana, and we just became such fans of that. And uh, just, we met a lot of wonderful people. But we had a group of about uh, 30, 35 couples that we ran around with doing things and belong to organizations. They were all from outside of New Orleans. They're all from other states, and all of us were trying to find a way out. Because it was just, it was so different. It was just, for us it wasn't good. It's a great place to visit then, uh, but staying there wasn't for me. Uh, I, uh, f at some point after four years, I, you know, I said, okay, we're going home. I got one of those trucks that say adventure and moving. Loaded that thing up. And my wife actually, she, I said, well, she said, well, we can't go back unless one of us have a job. So she went back and she got a job at KTOK Radio, which she'd worked a little bit when, when I was in my weather, my private weather service. And she, uh, 
And she says he went back and left me with Molly for like two, two weeks. Uh, and then we, I was going to come up with a truck, but she came back, back down to go back in the truck with me. But she said, Gary, she has on the same clothes that I left her with. I said, well, I washed them every night because that's what she wanted to wear. So I just wore whatever she had on, and, and she and I had a great time. But anyway, loaded up in that truck, and we went to Oklahoma, and I guess I shouldn't have been surprised I couldn't find a job. Uh, nobody would hire me. Even, you know, I went in to try to sell typewriters, and the guy said, well, you know, you got a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and Meteorology. You'll be gone. We're not going to hire you. I'm not going to get a job selling typewriters. Finally did get a job, though. It was with Key Magazine. As a little magazine went in all the hotels and motels <clears throat> and then, you know, told what to do in town. Colonel, Colonel somebody, I forgot his last name, ran that. And uh, I told the Colonel I could, I could sell that stuff. And I went out and I sold a lot of stuff, but most of it turned out to be bad debts. You know, people saw me coming, I'd go in those clubs and they'd buy a $2,000, you know, four-page spread and they'd go in the magazine they'd never pay for it. So I wasn't a real good salesman. I read a book that said, How to Raise Yourself from Failure to Success by Selling in Selling. And it said, make 10 calls a day, or whatever it was, 20, maybe it was 20. I didn't understand that meant make a call and try to sell it. I thought you just, so I'd call on 20 people and just hand them my card. If you need anything, call me. If you need anything, call me. It didn't work. Got a job. Uh, my wife was working at KTOK Radio and the Oklahoma News Network, and uh, I hung around down there, and you know, I'd drink their coffee. We didn't have a lot of coffee at home at that time, and and uh, they were putting in a radar, and their engineer was going to was going to run it. And I just thought, God, they're really going to need me. And they got that radar in, and they were about to get it in. I went up to Mr. Jones, the guy that managed the place. I said, Mr. Jones, you, you're going to need me, and blah, 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 blah. And Mr. Jones said, we are not going to meet you, need you. He said, our engineer is going to run this. So anyway, they got the radar in. I'm down there about 7 o'clock one morning, drinking their coffee. And a storm came up. The engineer couldn't run it, so they hired me on the spot. And KTOK was in a house, all right? You like you go out in the garage and you pull down those ladders. That's where my office was. They put a little desk up there, and the, the radar, the scope is about uh, six, seven inches across. And propped that up on a two by four. I had one little light hanging down. I had a microphone, but I had a job. Then they didn't pay hardly anything. But uh, that year, that first that year I was there, they fired me four times. We got we got through spring storm season, and, and uh, he said we won't need you anymore. So I went and collected information on summertime boating activities and all the lakes, how many people go to the lakes, and I wrote up a report to him on how many you know, people need weather. And so he hired me again. When that ended, uh, I, I did the same thing with, uh, with football. How many people go to football came? In those days, everybody went to Friday night football. And so I wrote a report, how many go, and so and anyway, he hires me back. And I don't remember the last time uh, what it was about, about what I did, but it was four times he fired me. He laughs about that now. He just passed away recently, but he used to laugh. And he fired me four times. But anyway, I was up in that little attic deal. One day the phone rang, and it was Jack Galeer from Channel 9. And Jack said, Gary, I've heard you on the radio. I'd like to talk to you. He said, I, I tell you, you sound a little crazy on the radio, but I want to talk. Because I had an imaginary 805-pound thunder lizard. And like on a, a clear July day, I would... Go the beep, 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 and say, tornado just crossed uh, Interstate 40, so, you know, the skies are clear, it's 110 degrees outside, and people loved it. Now, nowadays, you go to jail for that. Uh, but so he'd heard all that stuff. And uh, so anyway, when I did an audition, and, you know, I was just really surprised. They said, they called me back and said, we want to hire you. And I'm thinking, are you sure? <laughs> so uh, they hired me, and I, you know, I was going to start morning shows for a while, and I, I didn't have a suit. And so we went to Hobart because that's my wife's hometown, and we went to Levine's apartment store, I'm telling you, and bought me some blue pants, nice, kind of dark blue, blue pants, and a maroon coat, and a shirt that had I don't know what on it, and a real loud tie. And I, I was really dooted up, and I came back, and that's what I wore the first, I don't know how long, of that morning show. But I remember the first morning show, and uh, the, there's still a lot of hippies around those days because the, the Vietnam War was still winding down but they're still around and the camera's right there and I'm pretty nervous that guy with his real long hair and he looked like he'd smoked way too much stuff he leans around the camera he said stand by and he pointed at me and I remember thinking I don't want to do this and but he, then he said you're on and uh, I, I couldn't I could hardly speak I just opened my mouth it was kind of like you ever seen a fish on the bank out of water it's kind of the way I was I, I got real dry but 
I was I find I said fantastic. The weather's going to be fantastic, and, I, and that's about all I said to the whole thing. And that was my debut, and uh, you know they like me, and the people like me, and uh, we did a lot of crazy things there too, because I'd had that 805-pound fictitious thunder lizard. People didn't know it was fictitious. They didn't worry what it was. I, I used to say, you know, he's chasing Coors beer trucks and you know all this stuff, and people would stop and get a phone and call me. So uh, I got out of Channel 9. They wanted to see the 805-pound Thunder Lizard. Well, what were we going to do? Well, first we had a contest. We had several thousand entries. We had oil paintings, uh, you know, uh, watercolors. We had sculptures. In fact, right up there on the shelf, you see that vice with the horns on it? Mm -hmm. That came from the Watonga Fire Department. That was their entry. And I, my reaction was that. They don't have enough fires out there. They got time to do that. But uh, we had all these entries, and but that didn't satisfy people. They still want to see the uh, Thunder Lizard. So to lead up to this, I, I got a cameraman, he had a big old sheepskin coat on, and it was cold, you know, it was in the fall there, and, and uh, he had long flowing hair, and real curly and blonde, and a kind of rough looking character, boys wore cowboy boots, took him out behind, and I interviewed him on film. I said, sir, I understand you saw something. And he kind of kicked the gravel, and he looked right in that camera and said, well, he said, yes, sir, I, I did. He said, early Sunday morning, that should have been a giveaway right there, early Sunday morning, this thing ran across the road in front of me and I said what was it oh god he just kicked the gravel and he looked and finally looked right at the camera again and said he looked like to me an 805 pound thunder lizard so we took that we edited a little bit and put it on the air the six o'clock news and this is no exaggeration shut down the phone lines in this part of Oklahoma City because people loved it some people of course had seen the same thing even though it didn't exist and uh, finally, after that, we just had to kind of let it tail off because no, there was no way to say, you know, we never did tell them it wasn't there. And I still have people today send emails where they run into me and say, was, was that thunder lizard, was that, a, was that a motorcycle or was that a big lizard or, you know, it was, it was, just, it was just something that worked and the people loved it. It was just absolutely amazing. So, you know, when I got here, I didn't, I, I was right timing, right place. Uh, the warning, the weather warnings were terrible. Wasn't the fault of the people. It's just, you know, that's a long time ago. The radars weren't that good. Communication wasn't that good. And I established a network of uh, ham radio operators. We put during a storm. We'd put them, you know, like in a grid system every five miles, and they'd report in. I said, "This is Charlie. At, I'm at uh, Alpha 72, and I have a condition six on the ground, moving northeast 25. That'd be a tornado on the ground, moving northeast 25. Had a great system." And it's, since then, you just progressed all the way to storm chasers and storm trackers. But we did that, had some early success uh, with tornadoes. A lot of it was luck. Because uh, I didn't really know what I was looking at. I'd seen a radar one time in my life before I got to KTOK, and that was on Midway Island. So when they asked me at KTOK, have you ever used radar? I went, oh, yeah, yeah. But we installed radar here, and we ended up installing several radars here. And it was just uh, it was a fascinating start. And you know what? I was young, I didn't know how great it was. I didn't know how much fun I was having, you know. Uh, but it was great times. That's been almost, what, 30 years ago? 40, well, I've been on the air here 40. So I started in 72, and you know, I just stumbled and fell. And the one thing I did, and I try to share with the young kids, and they're not that interested in, in learning about it. It seems like to me, when you get old enough to have some wisdom, nobody wants to listen, even though it's pretty darn valuable. Because the way I. I've been I've been successful here not because I'm tall, dark, handsome, exceptionally talented, or the greatest meteorologist in the world. I did the things you had to do to build an audience. I decided early on that all these kids in these schools would grow up and have TVs. And so I started going to school. First, I started one or two schools, and I ended up over a period of years. I'd do like a school uh, in the morning, a classroom, classroom in the afternoon, and then sometimes a club, Lions Club at noon. Then I got where I was doing entire schools here all the way. I, uh, I, I've driven as far as Elk City, you know, to do a noon show, come back and do all my shows. Uh, and you know what? Those people grew up and they had televisions and they had kids and those kids have had kids and they trained them to watch Gary England. And uh, so it was, it was, I think it was just doing the thing you have to do to succeed. Uh, there was a guy in here many years ago and he wrote a book. He was, he was a professional writer and a uh, pretty impressive guy. Uh, I think it was in the shadow. I remember his name. The book was in the shadow of the tornado, and somewhere in there, he was talking about how successful Gary England is, and he had, he said, "Why?" You know, he and, he, and his was kind of a negative day. He, he couldn't understand because he was tall, dark, and handsome, and here I am, five foot seven, <laughs> and and he couldn't figure out why. You know, I'd become successful. He was dealing with the people, dealing with the people, talks, and, and man, I you know, I 
I did rodeos. They called me up one time from uh, Purcell, Oklahoma. Said, "Listen, we're gonna we have rodeo down here for a long month or so. We we'd like you to be in it." I've been naive all my life. I still am. I said, "What do you want me to do?" And they said, "We would like for you to ride a bull." I said, "No, I don't want to ride a bull." And this guy said to me, "Wait a minute. We have a trained bull." That's where I made my mistake. I said, "Well, how's that work?" <laughs> and he said, "Well, you get." You get the bull in the chute and you get on it and you open the gate and it walks out. And you blow a whistle on a little buck and you blow a whistle on a stop bucky. I said, you got a deal, brother. Because you're in television, we're always looking for a promotion to get us well known. And so for 30 days, I talked myself into a corner on radio and television. I'm going to ride this bull. And then, you know, and they had the first sellout in history, Purcell Rodeo. They went, I didn't know why they were all coming because they knew what was going to happen. I didn't. I got a book. They sent me a book a few days before the rodeo, and, it, and I, I lived out in the village then, and it, 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 it was titled in the paperback, Bull Riding. And I thought, why do, why do I need a bull riding book? And I remember fanning through it, and the, the line I remember was, Violent Random Motion. And I said, threw it away. Came the day of the uh, rodeo. My wife goes down, and some of her friends go down. I got a big white cowboy hat on, some big, it kind of meshes my ears out, and had a red, white, and blue vertical stripe uh, uh, cowboy shirt, kind of a cowboy shirt. I didn't have blue jeans. I had blue patent. Uh, well, first of all, I had just bell-bottom Levi's. Then I had blue patent leather boots from Napoleon Nash, which were not cowboy boots. So when I walked out there in that arena, that, that bull knew I was brand new. <laughs> and I go over there, and good Lord, he's just thrashing. You know, and the other slobbers fly. You've seen their eyes all bloodshot. <laughs> And I noticed that left horn, and then I noticed he had another one on the other side. They're matching horns, and I was I was weak kneed. I thought I can't do this, but I talked myself in the corner. So I get up there, you know, and my my cameraman was a guy that had been in Vietnam, um, Ray B. And Ray B. had been wounded three times. And up here, I'm up there trying to get on this bull, and he's yelling, "Don't do it, Gary! Don't do it!" And I said, "Thanks, Ray B. Thanks a lot." So every time he'd sit down and just get your legs around him, he'd try to hook my left way, leg with his left horn. And uh, this solid muscle, I just remember the, the, his muscle just running along my legs. I'm going, I just, I thought I was going to die. Now the guy helping me, an old cowboy, he's missing some teeth, had some tobacco in the corners of his mouth. His straw hat was kind of dirty and said he had several day growth beard. And, and he's, he's getting me all settled, you know, and they, you know, they tie your hand down when you get on there. They tie your, you tie you that bull. They wrap it so tight. And I'm, I'm there like this. I've got my hand down between my legs, and he said, uh, get, 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 your other, "Get your other hand in the air." So I got with my left hand in the air, and I'm here. To, and my eyes must have been silver dollars. I decided silver dollars. I said to him, "Well, where do I look?" And and he held his hand right in front of me, and he said, "Just look right at this with my hand." I went, "No, no, no." When I get out there, pointing at the arena, and he looked at me in a parcel tooth deal. He said, "You ain't gonna have to worry about that." <laughs> so uh, they opened the gate, and uh, and I found out, you know, you see those cowboys nod, that's nervousness. You just automatically, your head just starts shaking, you open the gate and out you go. And I don't know how we far, far we traveled, not very far, but I landed directly on my head, uh, rolled over, climbed the fence, <laughs> did a way to climb, climb the wire fence into the stands, and so I'd never do anything like that again. But it, it was great promotion. I go back and look at that old tape video from then and what everybody had on. I mean, people were there, and they, they all figured I was going to get killed. That's the reason they showed up. In fact, the, the rodeo association, I got in trouble for putting me on a bull, basically one that size and matching horns. <laughs> but I did a lot of that stuff. You know, I did parades and uh, contests and any place. Uh, I'm not good at reading. Never did really learn to read. Well, I have dyslexia. found out later. Uh, my daughter had her tested, and I'm listening to this, and I said, Doc, when you finish, can you talk to me? So I've never really learned to read. Well, when I read, I'm, words are missing. So I was invited to a style show. At Granite, that's where the reformatory is, way out west. So I'm out there. Uh, they got me the wrong size shirt and everything for my tux. I mean, I, look, I can imagine I look like a sad sack, and I'm trying to read. What is it, bodice or bodice? What? She has a pink. Whatever it was, I kept saying the wrong words, and the crowd got to laughing. <laughs> It's just, but they love it. You know, there's somebody, they see somebody up there, and they all, everybody makes mistakes in their job, and they love seeing me make mistakes. And I just really messed it up. But I did all those things. I, you know, uh, flipped out of a, uh, the cheese festival in Watonga, Oklahoma. Some young lady was driving the, the convertible with a clutch, an old car. And I put one in the back, she popped that clutch and rolled me out the back. Uh, 
I, uh, you know, I've, let me think, with horses, I've been bitten, I've been kicked, I've been thrown off. Uh, but it's, you're out there doing the things you have to do in my business to be successful. And it came naturally to me because I was having a real good time. And so all those years, of, you know, and I did, uh, and I, just as of uh, maybe five years ago, I still did like 80 appearances in, in one year, which is amazing. But it, it built a heck of an audience, and you know, and I can go in a place now, and the young kids come up to my, my used to be, they come and say, "Well, Mama watched," and that's my grandma used to watch you, and she taught that you, you know, we all know to watch you, and it's really, it's just fascinating how it worked. I've been very fortunate uh, for that to happen. Quite a celebrity. Yeah, you know, I never think about it. Uh, and with that comes responsibility too. So how do you, how do you balance that? Oh gosh, well. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes you just want to be a, what you call it, a normal person, go out and be wild and crazy and have fun. But yeah, be very careful what you do and what you say, how you do it, how you treat people. And, but I, you know, I love people. I always say, what is my passion and my love the, are the people of Oklahoma. My love is the, pe the people of Oklahoma. And we just, we just we hit it off. We saw for a while. I'm sure there's a lot of people don't like me. Burns Hargis. <laughs> Kidding. But, uh, you know, there is a responsibility of the, in the public, the public eye and all that, and there's a responsibility of here. But you got to switch gears, come in, and, and you try to keep people from dying. And in the early days, when the equipment was so bad, we'd have a bad tornado. And I remember we'd meet the next day. It was like two of us or three of us. So they wonder how many people we got killed last night, you know, we, because we never really knew for sure. But as uh, things improved and moved along, uh, you know, it's it's... Uh, you, you still have the responsibility here even at this point, you, you come in and, and you know, sometimes we have huge tornadoes and a lot of times a lot of people are killed, but we do save a lot of lives and it says on me it's a whole bunch. I mean, we got good people all through this building and they all bust their tail to do what they got to do, but it's just been a process. I started basically with a chalkboard, you know, and magnetic numbers and letters to all this high-tech stuff now and really I think sometimes the chalkboard was better because you could really explain it. Now it's in the machine, and you can't really move it and shake it like you'd like to. But, but anyway, it's it's been every part of it has been a process. The severe weather warning has been a process. Of learning how to to behave in life and 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 do the things you have to do uh, to become successful. A process. Learning to live with management. That's a process which I'm still undergoing at this particular point in my life. Uh, so <laughs> everything in my life has been a process and. Uh, a lot of it came naturally, but none, none of it came easy. Uh, it seems like, but it's it's been a it's been a fantastic ride. It really has. Well, it seems like humor has a role to play too. Yeah, you got you got to have fun. You know, people love to laugh. Early on, we had they we went to an hour format, and we had Jerry Adams, real good looking dude, not too swift. Made a lot of mistakes. You know, he'd say he always said, Jerry, your tongue overloads you. Uh, your brain. I'm sorry. He, and he'd be in trouble for saying bad things to people. And that Ralph Combs, tall, good looking, distinguished, God, good looking guy, you know, both of them were good looking. And here I am. And Ralph came along and he just picked on me incessantly. Just, and it was great. He'd pick on me about what, whatever I had on, all that. And the audience would just immediately respond and they'd jump on my side and be after Ralph. And I didn't even know what he was doing, but it was building me up the whole time. Well, one day, uh, we had Pam Olson, excuse me, Pam Olson was in, she's a reporter, and she had done a story, I probably shouldn't even tell you this, I won't even tell you that one, but anyway, she had done a story on a certain type of transplant, and, and you could easily think it was a different kind of transplant, and then when I had this, and the story went on and on and on and on, and then when it was over, I get back to the desk, you know, Adams is laughing so hard, he has his head on the desk. Ralph can't hardly speak, and on the six o'clock news, he turns to me and said, and Gary is going to, you know, have this transplant. And uh, then we're all screaming. Well, it had to do with, uh, with the kidney transplant. But they used different phrases and everything. It, it was easy to mistake. And uh, we almost got fired over because we couldn't talk. My wife said, all you could hear at home, they, the, the camera was on, and they went to black, but the audio was on, so he said, you hear all these people just hysterically screaming and laughing. And uh, a few days later, the guy, when we were in all this trouble, the guy who had been on the, uh, the, what was the machine they used, dialysis machine, 
long when he was in Oklahoma, he said he and his he said he and his wife got on the floor laughing five minutes before anybody else started to laugh. He said they were just screaming. The story was so funny, and then Ralphs and all this stuff. But uh, that worked. It worked to our advantage. And so the station. A few days later, the news director gets us out there, puts out and the camera comes on, and said, and "These guys caused quite a disturbance. Said some things probably didn't need to be said. Uh, do we want to keep them?" And so they had this big write-in campaign, and so we got to stay. But that is just insane, crazy stuff, man. I just, uh, I, you know, and I wish I would have kept better records. But so many wonderful things happened. And, and this is kind of a cute story I love to tell people. They invited me out to Hinton to be in, in the parade. It's a rodeo parade. And like I said, I've been kicked and bitten and thrown off and all that. And I said, look, give me a good horse, will you? I, you know, I'm just tired of dealing with bad horses. So I get out there to go to the parade. It's a real short Main Street. I pull up, there's my horse. It's all sad, it's leaning against the building. I, no, I wonder if he drinks. You know, I didn't know. They'll go out and I get, they get me on him and I can ride it downtown and he just kind of plop, he's kind of sway back, I just plop along, just slow. We finally get there, everybody lines up, the flag and I don't know, it was a band or what it was and I'm right, I'm right, you know, I'm to, we're starting down the street, the queen of the rodeo is on the right, I'm on the left and they start the parade and everybody moves except my horse and he won't move and by that time the 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 queen of the parade was down there maybe 15 20 30 many yards from us my horse bolts toward her horse runs over slams into her horse drives it into a car and everybody like well it's normal so we get it all straight now we get lined up it happened again and uh, we tried it again and uh, i got back to the to the uh uh, corral, and I asked the guy, I said, what's wrong with this horse? And I told him what happened. He said, oh, there's nothing wrong with that horse. He said, that's a rodeo pickup horse. He, that's the type of horse when the guys are riding broncs, and when they're ready to get off, this horse comes up and slams into the, to the side of it, and you get off and you jump on the on the pickup horse. That horse is just doing his job. That scared me to death. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just, uh, you do all those things. You know, we did what was called those terrible twisters, because I did classrooms, then I did schools, I did, you know, town meetings and stuff, but finally a guy I worked with here, a great, brilliant guy, Jerry Dalrymple, he came up with the idea. He said, let's go have a tornado show. I'm going, yeah. So we went to Stillwater, and Jerry had about 50 TVs that they wired up. We're in, it was kind of like in a church. I think maybe it was at a church. But we go up to Stillwater, and there's 750 seats in that thing. I'm thinking, boy, this is a mistake. And, you know, I put together some film tapes on tornadoes and pretty scary stuff and we advertised, advertised, advertised. We was going to start at 7, you know, at 6.50. We're sitting here, there's nobody there. I think, I got to get out of here. So, but about 65, it just poured in and filled up. Didn't think much about it. So, we went back again there next, the next year and we, and we went to a place that held 1,500. They showed up again, but we still, you know, I didn't think anything about it. It was tornadoes and, you know, it was free. The next year, the first place we went was Enid. It was the first time I really knew that was, there was, we, we had something. It was at Phillips University, and Jerry and I go up. The, the whole crew would go up before, and by then we had video, and we had two, two players in case one goes out, and by then we had our own screens and sound systems and you name it. You'd be deaf by the time you leave. It was so loud. But Jerry and I get out of the car, and we're walking toward the, the, the appeared to be the gym or whatever it was, and uh, there's people just everywhere. I don't know exactly. It was just everywhere. I said, Jerry? There must be a basketball game tonight. <laughs> and they were going to the Terrible Twister show. And so we get them in there. They brought my mom in from ceiling. And, and we did those for 20, 25 years. And uh, most we ever had was 7,000 people. Uh, that was the myriad. We had 4,000 uh, the Norman. Uh, which is, when we stopped them about seven years ago, they had the largest crowd at the Enid Arena that they've ever had. And it was just tornadoes and stuff and having fun and safety precautions and and that, you know, I always had a little baby there and I take my picture of this baby, you know, and we signed I'd sign every autograph until it was one in the morning. So I did the things I had to do. It's all I knew to naturally do. So that worked. But uh, it's been fascinating what's the the growth that way, the process of gathering an audience and uh, it's been with the equipment, the weather equipment, the advances that have been made. It's just phenomenal what's happening in the entire environment, you know, when you think about it. Before, I don't know, the old radar, you take a lead pen or pencil number two, 
and 30 miles on the radar was the length of that eraser. And if it's out there, you go 30, 60, 90, you'll be here in three hours, okay, you'll be here in three hours. That's how we measured. And nowadays, it's, you know, it's, it's automated. In fact, we, we, we produced the first automated projection system ever right here at Channel 9. And uh, in those days, the first one we, we built, we programmed, looked like a racetrack because it would be this oval goes out and it would populate it with every town in there and tell what time the storm would be there. But uh, now it's, you know, it's fancy stuff and it's, uh, that has come so far. Used to, we guessed it. Now we know exactly. The good thing about a big tornado, we know where it is, we know where it's going, we know what time it's going to get there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we, we've done a lot of really good things here and it never could have happened except that uh, John Griffin, the father, always backed everything up. He, he liked weather and he was just great. And, and I've got an email from him, I don't know when it was, but he said, Gary, I was trying to get him to buy a Doppler radar nobody had heard about. It. And nobody knew what they were. I hardly, I can't even spell it. But I've been following the research and so I made a presentation to John and a couple other people, and he said, Gary, you, you have never misled me on what we need. So we helped, uh, we, well, in fact, we were in the development and then installed the world's first commercial Doppler radar right here. We were in years before the Weather Service ever had theirs out and operating. And I tell you, you know what? All I had, I didn't know anything about it. I'd followed research and I had three 8x10 glossies of a Doppler presentation of what it should look like if there's a tornado. And I had to pinned up on the side of the radar so I had to look at them. And uh, the first time we turned on that Doppler radar, it shows also, you know, shows precipitation, but also show wind velocities, direction and speed. It looked like scrambled eggs. And I just remember thinking, whose idea was this? Of course, it was mine. I was afraid I'd get fired over it. But we got it on, and uh, we're looking down south, I don't know what year this was. We ordered it in 77 or 78, got it in like 82. This probably was 83 approximately. And, uh, and I'm looking at the storm down there, Falls Valley, and I look at it, and it looks like the picture. Well, I said, uh, there might be. So I called the police department. In those days, you'd call the police and check. I said, well, what do you got? And he said, well, let me check. And the, and the sheriff, whatever he was, went outside, and he came back. And he said, yeah, he said, there's, there's a tornado. It's a funnel cloud in the air here. So and then I knew I had, <coughs> excuse me, I knew I had something, you know. So I uh, issued the warning, and really upset the weather service. But you know, I wasn't gonna wait and call the guy. guys. Is it okay if we issued the warning? You know, it's, the guy sees a tornado, and the one tornado, there were two of them actually. One tornado hit Ada uh, from that storm and killed one person, and the other one went, went across Conewa Lake. But uh, that was the first uh, uh, commercial dop That was the first warning, Doppler warning ever. And we didn't know it was a big deal. Later, everybody said, well, that's really a big deal. And years later, we're going, really? Uh, we were just, we were doing what we had to do to succeed. And really, we had meetings not on, can we do something great today? It was, what can, how can we improve this? And back then, how can we make, we don't have to use a pencil to measure 30 miles. And we, that's when computers came along. We started a program. We started doing these things. And same thing with the Doppler radar. And the little map that appears in the corner of the screen. Mm -hmm. That originated out of this station, too. And uh, the, but the way it used to look, you had a piece of red paper, you had a map of Oklahoma on it. And if it was a tornado warning for Oklahoma County, you would take an X-Acto knife, which is real sharp, and you'd cut out Oklahoma, slap it on there, and Oklahoma would be red, the rest of the map would be white, and you put it up and put a camera on it. That's, so, but now you see the automated thing down in the corner, and the crawl goes across. So the advances have just been fantastic, and we've been very fortunate to, to be a part of some of them. So uh, it's been wild. And the mesonet comes into place? Oh, yeah, the mesonet's it. fantastic. Ken Crawford, who actually was really instrumental, he was uh, down at OU in really getting the mesonet going. He and I fought like cats and dogs because at some point, uh, this is before weather radio. Ken, Ken, Ken was working at that time for the weather service, and maybe the climate survey too. I don't remember which. We're good friends now, but boy, we had some knockdown dragouts. But uh, a guy came to me from Mississippi, and uh, he said, "Listen, I got." this idea you know let's let's he said i want to be able to warn people i want to send a signal out to them warn them so i said okay because all they have is an idea well i designed this thing here and you can see it has wind speed direction probability got all the current conditions we put weather towers out and uh then the warnings for tornadoes severe storm travel advisory all that stuff this thing's right there it's amazing and then we came out with that ken crawford you know was instrumental in the mesonet, he saw that as a threat to the National Weather Service, and really it kind of was because we had jumped past them, and these things go in people's houses, and I didn't think of it in those terms, but 
So he and I had several confrontations, and it, it was kind of an ugly time in his life and an ugly time in my life. And we were, and we were good friends now. <laughs> a few years ago, several years ago, I saw him. Hey, Ken, how you doing? He said, Gary, uh, I want you to know, you know, uh, that me in the past was a different person. I said, me too, Ken, <laughs> because we acted like two kids. He was protecting his turf, I was protecting mine. You have the mezzanine. I don't know how many stations we got now, 100, 111 or so. And from, from a weather standpoint, from waiting years ago for Will Rogers to take an observation, some guy to go outside and read the thermometer and all that, and great information, but came once an hour and you wait for the next era. And now, you know, it's continuous uh, with the mesonet. It's just, it's absolutely stunning. You know, you can, you, you look at the last six hours of the wind direction. All those things are so important to us as meteorologists, where the storm is going to form, how, front, how fast the front moving. Uh, you look at solar radiation on the mesonet sites. It, you know, it's one that's getting most radiation. The skies are clear there. You don't even need a satellite to look and see. You know, you learn so much from it. But Ken was instrumental in that. It's just, it's a fabulous tool. Uh, I hope they never think of cutting it because it's absolutely phenomenal. Now, other people have followed, you know, there's now there's one in West Texas, and, and I was covered with the mesonet sites. But uh, yeah, it's, it's really, it was a brilliant concept. So through your career, you've had various com competitors. Yeah. Like and whether yeah. it's the next radio station or yeah. the, the National Weather yeah, Service. Yeah, we could be against radio, we could be against television, and National Weather Service. But you know what, in the final analysis, it made us all better. Because I was not afraid to step out and issue warnings and they didn't like it now I can see why they didn't like it but then I was young and thought I was pretty intelligent <laughs> Imagine you, as a, I just I, I just thought I really knew something but uh, but we did some good things we got the warnings out and there was always confrontation with the weather service over issuing the warnings before they do it and my reaction to them was look my spotters that I have out there they call and say a tornado's coming across the field toward such as a cation for example uh, I'm going to warn them. I'm not going to call you and say, is it okay? And that caused more problems. So we all could be the thing is, it made the weather service better. They're, they're darn good. They, that's good. It makes my job so easy now. It's embarrassing. But we would fight with them and, uh, and the other stations. But it made us all better. I think Oklahoma was the recipient of all of that in a very positive way because the warnings here are better any place in the world, period. And, and a lot of it was that early competition. Weather service never had competition. Television stations had never really competed. Uh, channel 4, was it Jim Williams that was on Channel 4? And I came in here as a young buck. And I issued a warning for Union City. Tornado came in from the northwest. Uh, I put it out before the weather service did. And I'm not bragging, it's just a fact. And tornado hit, I think, killed one guy. I came in from the northwest. And some guy snapped some great pictures. And he called me up. He said, I got some great pictures. You know, I'll get them developed and I'll get them to you. And he did that. And I think I showed him the next day. Well, he told me later. I show this picture of Jim Williams at Channel 4, calls him and chews him out, wanting to know why he gave me the pictures and not him. So that's the kind of thing, we were just, the competition was just fierce. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but like I said, the people of Oklahoma have been the recipient of really some good things from that. But it was agonizing at times, you know. But it's the best life. And what's great, Ken and I are great friends now. But it was, it was, it was, and it was funny, man. Do you know Ken Crawford? No, I haven't. He's really a magnificent guy. He was, when I was living in New Orleans, where I worked for A.H. Clinton Associates, he was actually in Slidell, or was Slidell. He's, he was with the Weather Service down there at that same time. It was just pretty much amazing. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, so a lot of, and so many great advances. You know, the radars now, the dual polarization, all these things that come with are just, they're just so neat. You have to stay up. You do have to stay up? Up with it. You have to work with it, and you know, uh, I've been around a while, and uh, it's still exciting to read about it and figure it out and follow the research. And, and nowadays it's so automated, like with the dual pole, that's best for the weather service because they have the capability and the people and the talent and all that to analyze it very quickly. And really, they send the results to us, and they're in uh, warning decision updates, and they'll cover what they're seeing on the dual pole and all that stuff. So for television, it's not that good because it takes time to do it, and we're just Tornadoes on the ground moving northeast, 30 going to hit your house, 210 going to kill you. <laughs> that type of thing. Uh, it's, the advances have been fantastic, and I, I think they'll continue. They may slow down somewhat just due to you know, the way the economy is and the funding that's available. But uh, it's, it's just been f nothing short of phenomenal what's gone on. You know, When I went to, to college, though, you, at, in meteorology, we started out, as I mentioned, in engineering physics, which was on campus. Then 
the meteorology school, which was kind of an orphan. Nobody really wanted it. They moved us to North Campus, which is those old World War II barracks, and that's, uh, that's I, I worked there, worked there at the Atmospheric Research Lab for a while. But we had classes out there. We, it's, it took years for meteorology to really to get a hold, get its hooks in the OU. It was Dr. Walter Saussure was the head of the department. They brought him in to start it. And Dr. Saussure, it was a big impact on my life too. He, he loved to derive equations. And you know, the radar equation, if you hold it up, you know, it's a, it's a foot long and he liked to drive it. Where does everything come from? But if he's, as he's doing this derivation of an equation, if the bell rings, he stops right there, alrighty? And you come back with class the next day, he starts right where he stopped. If he stopped at a x to the, x to the minus 20, that's, that's where he starts. And you, go, you couldn't, you're afraid to miss class. He was smart in that respect. Uh, great guy. Yeah, he was. I remember one time I was struggling with a class. He said, mm, what do you need in that class, Gary, to get out of it? And I told him, and I got it. <laughs> different times, different places. One of the guys I worked with down there, I was, I was a research assistant. I just did, you know, ran the calculator and all that stuff. A guy named uh, Stanley Barnes. And Stanley uh, was always kind of boring. Since then I found out that Stanley was in the weather service. He was an AG2 and I was an AG2. Uh, but he, uh, he, he was uh, down there as a graduate student. He went on, but there's, in meteorology and mathematics, there's something called Barnes Objective Analysis. You feed all this data in and it'll analyze it. Well, he's the one that did it. I mean, it just, uh, you know, and when you're young, you don't think about it. But, uh, I'm on the same roof with this guy. He was just like everybody else. But I gave a talk. I got to be one of the, the speakers at the dedication ceremony for the, for the Weather Center at Norman. And I gave a talk. And uh, I get an email from Stanley Barnes, and he was living in he's living in Colorado. He's funny. He said, "Gary, you never were a very good student, you know." <laughs> and I'm sitting there, yeah, yeah. But he said, then after hearing your speech, I realized you'd already had all of this before. I went, "Yeah," and it was very boring. And uh, but it was just great times, great people. Uh, uh, I worked directly for uh, Victor Whitehead. Uh, he was uh, getting his uh, PhD. And he was a super guy, and we had uh, uh, I worked I worked in this room, and I also worked with Anna Marie and Jürgen Linzer. They were German. They were Fulbright scholars, and it was just, it was just fascinating. Uh, you know, then we all worked under uh, Vic. It was just uh, I look back now. I, I just wish I'd paid attention, taking more pictures, and taking more time. You know, crazy things like we they were doing lightning research, and there was this big commotion in the hall one day. You know, the halls are kind of unstable. The old wood barracks, but anyway, they were firing this this electricity through this plexiglass deal, and they thought they'd discovered something major. There was a little fork-like looking thing coming out, and long story short, short it turned out to be a reflection and a scratch in the plexiglass. But here are all these scientists running around, and it turns out it's a scratch in the plexiglass. It was just great. It was just great fun, great times. Uh, and you know, now I look back, it seemed like it took forever to get through. And, you know, but as you know, when, my gosh, college is so short, four years in reality. And when you're younger, it's forever. But anyway, all that stuff with OU is great and wonderful. And they, they have, they, well, meteorology school down there is the, the most difficult undergraduate uh, curriculum on campus. It is. I don't know how these kids do it nowadays. It is just absolute murder. They'll have a, yeah, I, I, I go down to KZ, speak to the freshman class. But one day I called up, I don't know which professor it was, I said, how many, uh, how many freshmen do you have? And I think this is right after Twist, the movie Twister. He said, uh, some, let's say for example, a hundred is more than that, but a hundred. And I said, well, how many uh, sophomores? And it was like 80. And how many juniors? 40. How many seniors? 12. It is, they sort them out, and it's, it's a tough, tough, tough. Uh, and, I, and I struggled. I struggled through it. Well, you're in engineering physics. I remember I looked at, I said, what am I doing in engineering physics? Uh, it was just, it was, but it was great. It was great education, great fun. I probably learned more. I learned a lot in the Navy as far as operational forecasting. I probably learned more uh, down at A.H. Glenn because I was, I had a baby and a wife and I had to feed them and so I had to learn. I had to say, yes, sir. <laughs> But anyways, education was, a, was an interesting uh, effort. Uh, the time in New Orleans was great. The Navy was fantastic, great experience. 
uh, and then you know through Channel Nine all these years since '72, it's just been a process. Every little, it's like a tree, I guess. All the little roots go out, and, and some of them don't quite work right. But fortunately, in mind, most of them turned out working pretty good. Well, when you first started this study in meteorology, had you planned to do te television? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Television. Uh -huh. When I was a kid, uh, lived in western Oklahoma in the country. There was a guy on, I guess I was in seventh grade, uh, there was a guy on television named Harry Vogt. Now we didn't have a TV, but mom and dad had taken me to grandma's house every Sunday to watch Harry. And Harry was on during the week, but I could never see him. But on Sundays he had a 15 minute weather show. And Harry talked about troughs and jet streams. I mean, I just sit there in front of that TV. I didn't really know, you know, what was going on, but I knew I liked weather. I, lo I loved storms, even though they frightened me. Uh, but Harry was fantastic, and I'm sitting there, I don't know when it was, I'm staring, and my dad said, uh, I told I turned to Dad, I said, Dad, I want to be one of those, and I pointed at the TV, and, and he said, what is he? I'm, I don't know, but I want to be one. And so that was in the seventh grade. I, uh, I wanted to be, you know, and uh, join the service so I could go in the Navy Weather Service, which I did, and learned an awful lot there. Because uh, you, when you forecast there, you know you can kill a lot of people in airplanes if you're not careful. So I was reasonably successful in that, and no one was killed that I know of due to weather. Uh, but then getting out and going to college, you know, meeting my wife at Southwestern, and uh, it was a wonderful time. And then going down to OU, all oh, that's just a, it was a direct result. I, I like weather, but I saw Harry, and Harry talked about his family and his kids, and he'd show pictures of them and. And it was just, and he had, he had a great personality, and I just, that's, that's the reason I'm in this business, is Harry Bilton. Finally got to meet him on my 25th anniversary. They had a surprise anniversary party for me, and I was really totally surprised, and then in walks Harry. Oh, God. Just amazing. Uh, but he's the reason, and, uh, you know, like I said, school was difficult for me, uh, but got through it. I got through it because I wanted to do it so bad. And, uh, I wanted to make sure I was a meteorologist. I didn't know I was going to be a mathematician. <laughs> I had to, when I got to college, I had to start back with Algebra 1 because the coaches taught me all the algebra. You know, now they can go into college and they're ready for Calc 3 or whatever it is. And so it was a long road. I took every class, math class possible and they ended up taking, then I think I was there that summer when I graduated. After that, I took one graduate course, uh, solid analytical geometry something. God, I was a fool to enroll in that, but I was feeling pretty, you know, hey, I graduated, I'm feeling pretty tough now. But, uh, and I, I don't know if I use any of that anymore, but the whole, the training and the logic and all, it's, it was great. So what do you use? <laughs> well, uh, you you use, what you do use when looking at the maps, you understand the processes that are involved. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, induction of positive vorticity, and that's a, that's a spreading out of the airloft that gives you uplift. We talk about horizontal vorticity, and that's a, the and, and even vertical vorticity. The in, the, uh, the likelihood that the air is going to spin as it moves. So you, un you understand those processes and the, and the equations that go into them. But all that's processed now by computers. But you look at the map. I can look at a map here, and I can tell you what's going on with it. But now all that goes into a computer, and it comes out in really beautiful pictures. Okay, where are we? Can I tell one of my Burns Hargis deals. One night. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't tell you that. <laughs> well, you had science, and then at some point you had to learn some of the personality. How do you, how do you develop that personality? You know what? I think it's in the genes. Maybe some person can develop personality. I remember when I was a senior in high school, another kid and I did a play. It wasn't a senior play, but we did a play, and we didn't study the lines. We put them in a little basket in front of us, and then the pages got mixed up. So. You know, he was pretty stiff, but I just started throwing stuff out, and we had a good people laughed and cried, and, you know, it was just, it was crazy stuff. But it, I think it's either, you're either good at it or you're not. Maybe you can learn it, but it's forcing, uh, you know, good sense of humor is important. Uh, but I think it's either there or it isn't there. I mean, in sealing, in my senior year, you know, you didn't, played much music in school, so got ready for that. I think the same day we messed up the, the senior play thing is that, uh, that Buddy Holly, and I don't know what song it was, but that went boom, 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 and everybody got in, the, and we had a really nice, nice auditorium there at the ceiling, and they got everybody, all the teachers were in there, and I went back and flipped that thing over the intercom, came Buddy Holly, and Peggy Sue, Peggy Sue, Peggy Sue, oh my God. God, they were just furious. 
but uh, I always experiment along those lines. <laughs> but I, I just think it, it just came naturally, and uh, I found that if you plan something funny, especially on television, it may fall mm -hmm. flat. The best moments are when it just happens. Uh, you know, when Jerry Adams is on the set, he's up there at the end of the news, he said, and that's the news, and he shoved like that. He rolled right off the back. All you saw, you know, it's just stuff like that's what's really great. <laughs> but uh, some of my funnier things when I mispronounce words and get my tongue tangled up, and I've said about everything you can imagine on the air live accidentally. Uh, you know, just funny stuff. One day I'm on the set, and the guy who works at one of the hospitals out here had done a little interview, and he walks across, doesn't realize he walks between me and the camera. I mean, it's just. And he said he would just look so funny when he did because he stopped right in the middle and looked at the camera and those big eyes like that. And it's just those things that happen. And all I did was laugh. And you'd see other people around would go, well, I will report that interruption, you know. And I never have been a favorite of the news department because I'm not, you know, they're very precise in what they do and they have you know, certain things they have. They deal with death, destruction, and human suffering all the time. I just deal with it during the spring, usually. But uh, it's... Uh, it's just crazy how it works. I, I don't know, but you know, I've always pulled jokes. I've always had fun. Uh, you know, been in trouble a lot when I was younger. Uh, when I go driving someplace now, I still make a new friend every time. Usually, it's a highway patrolman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, last time I got stopped in the city wasn't that long ago, and the guy stopped me, and he'd already checked my. See, it's that, that talk about things change. He checked. I mean, he plugged in my tag number. And it was raining, and I was on 150th, and I was scooting along, and I saw the lights behind me. I don't know how they do that. They're just there all of a sudden. And the time he walked up to the car, uh, he just he said, you England? You Gary? I said, yep. He said, get out of here. And so, you know, that's usually what happens. I haven't had an actual ticket in many years. I always, I always call it making new friends. <laughs> but, you know, as I look at it, it's just, uh, you know, I can, my age and my where I am in life, you can look back and look at it. It's been, it's been fantastic, but it's been a process in all areas. And with David, you know, sometimes he and I almost get in rationally matches. It's so serious because we disagree over things. That's a good thing. He allows the disagreement, and uh, I've gotten a little bit better in that area. Uh, but it's just all little bits and pieces. You know, I, I when the uh, Dr. Carr from OU, a meteorology professor, was head of the department, he brings the freshman class down here each year <clears throat> for a tour, and I always talk to the kids. Uh, when I was that old, I didn't think I was a kid, but they're kids. I don't care what age they are. And I always say, let me, let me just tell you something. Life is a series of decisions, and each decision you make is going to affect your life one way or the other. I try to make the best decision you can make in your, every time. You don't know sometimes when you're making decisions, but let me tell you, life is a series of of decisions, so be careful what you decide to do. Be careful. When you, are you going to drive fast? Are you going to wear your seatbelts? Things like that. Where are you going to go to school? Are you going to run across the street? Are you going to walk across the street? It's all decisions, decisions, decisions. And uh, some of them get it, and some of them don't. But I, I really believe. I look back through the years. It's it's a serious decision. I was here. I decided to join the Navy. I joined the Navy. I get out. I go out Southwestern. And meet my wife. We have a wonderful daughter now. I uh, had her, I uh, think we've been married seven years then when we had her down in New Orleans. But uh, got out of school, actually when I got out of school, I put that weather service in for a little while, made the decision to go s make some money so I could pay for food. Made a decision to go to New Orleans. And at some point I made a decision to leave there. And like I tell the kids, these are the big decisions you make. There are a lot of small ones that you hardly notice that can really screw you up too. Made the decision to come back to Oklahoma, came back without a job and all that stuff. Uh, got the job, to, uh, decided I'd hang around there at the radio station, decided I'd do that, got the job there. All this sounds simple, it's not, let me tell you. Uh, but anyway, then when they came out, and, and you know when I told, <laughs> I came out and did the, they called, you know, called from jail and I said, you know, we'd like to talk to you and all that stuff, and did the interview and the taping, and they liked me, and I went home and told Mary, my wife, I said, you know, honey, I really like radio, you know, it's more creative and it's all this stuff. But then I decided I should go into TV. What if I just said, okay, I'm going to stay in radio? It'd probably been great, but fun, but this is what I've been involved in has been exceptional. And, and uh, so, and not much due to me. <laughs> it's just been right place, right time. And uh, it's worked very well with all of them. As I tell this kid, everything's a decision. Just keep that in mind. And a lot, there's more to life than that, but 
if you make the wrong decisions, there is no life, you know. Well, at some point, were you presented with an opportunity to, to leave Oklahoma again? Okay. Yeah, when you know, I was gone from the time of the service, and I spent four years in New Orleans, and both times I swore I'd never leave Oklahoma. And uh, and after and I got here, uh, very short after I was here, I had a job offer at WFAA in Dallas, and I didn't do that. And, uh, and a lot of the news directors would tell you, you know, my voice won't work back east. I was offered a, in his ABC weekend in New York City. And I said, man, I am not going to New York City, you know. There, you can't go to those schools and all that stuff. And, and uh, ser several other places, uh, San Antonio, Atlanta. But I always kind of felt like what I do, what I'm doing works here. May not work any place else in the world. Uh, I had three chances to go to the Channel 4. They were always trying to hire me. They offered me racehorses. And I, I don't like racehorses, you know. I'm sorry. Uh, but I was just blessed to have, be able to experience that stuff, you know. And uh, so I had the opportunity to go over there, which wouldn't have been very far. Channel 5 had tried to hire me, but I thought it works right here. It may not work anyplace else. So, yeah, I could have moved a few places. San Francisco was another one I had a chance to go to. But, you know, I'd come home, and, you know, I'd had that two years, 11 months, 22 days in the service. And, you know, it was, let me tell you, the island I was on, Midway Island, mile and a half long, half mile wide, 5,000 sailors and marines and seabees. It was a long year, let me tell you. <laughs> and when you're short, they pick on you. Well, yeah, I'll tell you one quick story, may or may not want to include. There was a guy that we called Duff, his name Jerry Dufford. And he was a little older than us, he was 21 years old. I thought he was the oldest person I'd ever seen. And on Midway Island, we're doing, I was in weather, <clears throat> and uh, we went to the movie, little tiny island, had a little movie, we went down the movie, we were coming back to the barracks, there's a little sand hill there. And we, there's, I don't know, five or six of us, and the, the whole side of the sand hill raises up and it's CBs. They're the construction guys with the Navy, and they're just mean, mean, junkyard dogs. I mean, they're great guys, but they'll just, they love to fight. And they just plowed through us like a train, just knocked the daylights out of us, kicked us down, knocked us down, all that stuff. And so we went, got back to barracks, we told Dufford what had happened. And Dufford was not a big guy. He said, oh, I'm going to handle this. And Dufford, he was 21, and he, his hair had receded way back. He looked to us like he was probably 50 or 60. But uh, a few days later, he went to enlisted men's club, and he found him, as the story goes, I didn't get to see all this happen, but he found a CB, in the, and they had a few beers, quite a few beers, and Dufford waited until about closing time. They get ready to close, a couple minutes before. Dufford goes out the back door and goes around the front and waits for the CB to walk out the front door. CB walks out the front door, and Dufford hits him just as hard as he can, and Dufford breaks his hand. Give you some idea. Hit this guy. I don't know what the force was, but he snapped two bones in his hand, and then that guy proceeded just to beat him half to death. And so it was. A, it was an interesting, interesting time on that island, because it was just. Uh, it was. It was interesting. But that you know, didn't want to make a decision. Didn't want to continue that. I didn't get on the ships. I didn't have a girl on each arm. I didn't have a girl on one arm. And uh, so I decided that wasn't good. That's four, four years in New Orleans. I learned a lot. It was a powerful, powerful time. But I didn't like New Orleans, and this one of those days I decided if I could ever get home, never leave it again. And so that's been, I've made good decisions along those lines. A lot of times I don't make good decisions, and I, and I pay for it, but I think along those lines I made really good decisions. You build an audience. In my business, you have to build an audience, little by little. And I share that with the kids that come here. I say, I can give you the keys to make this success. And I'll sit them down and go through, here's what you got to do. And nowadays, most of them are not willing to do it. They just think they want to be on TV. And if in, in the coming years, TV is going to go away to a large extent as we know it now. And uh, they don't, it's just fascinating. I have a few. You know, Gary Lezak was here. Gary Lezak's chief up in Kansas City. Gary's a really homely guy, and he'll tell you that. Huge nose, no hair, big ears, but you just love him. Oh my gosh, he, we had him doing the morning shows, and, and he's been a big hit in Kansas City. Uh, he was one that kind of followed the, and I fired him. He was here nine or ten years. And I don't know what he did now, but I said, Gary, and I knew he needed to get out of the nest. He needed, and so I said, you got to go, Gary. And, but anyway, he and I are the best friends now. And I told him at the time, I said, Gary, you'll find this is the best thing for you. And now he, he says, God, that was the best thing that ever happened to me is you firing me. So I've had some like that are really good. Other ones, you know, whatever. But it's uh, 
it's a it's an interesting world because a lot of people come into this a lot of them are uh, you know they, they're really prima donnas and they want to be they think they're the star and all this stuff you know and man it's a job you know and it's not 40 hours a week most it's weeks not you know i look at me i'm so tired right now i can already move uh, i worked 11 o'clock tonight and i was in here at what one today or noon and that's a short day but it, it, it's what you sign up to do is it normally 3 to 11, though? Normally, normally about 3 to 11. Uh, normally I'm in earlier than that because there's, you know, there's a lot of meetings to go to, budget, and <laughs> you name it. Well, when you're having a weather event, or you know you're going to have a, a mm -hmm. weather event, do you do anything in particular to prepare for that? Try to get a good night's sleep. Uh, now, nowadays we know when the events are coming. I, I exercise, but before a, an event I exercise just as much as I possibly can. So I, I, you know, I get the, the, I can stand up, so to speak. But you know, we do a lot of planning, a lot of pre-planning nowadays. You know, where we're going to put the troops out there, we're going to put the people, the storm trackers, where the trucks go, where the helicopters are going to go, and all that's pre-planned. And sometimes it blows up, blows up on the day of. But there's a lot of pre-planning. You get the people out there, so it's a, it's a process like everything else. We start the day before at least. And what assets are available? Who's sick? Who's available? You know, whose cameras? Bro all these things. Then you get them out and get them in position, and the storms fire, and it's just. It's just the darnest thing you've ever seen in your life. You guys see it at home, maybe. Get back here, it is absolutely amazing. But you may you maintain calm mm -hmm. during, during that. Though. Well, so, so, the other day we got a new piece of equipment and everything was messed up. And it's a touch screen and it wouldn't move. I'm thinking if I had a hammer, I would knock this thing. And it was, you know, it, it was this very stormy night and, and it's supposed to like an iPad. And you do it and it wouldn't change. You. And then it go, boom, 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 and then it wouldn't erase. And you're up there trying to keep it calm, but it was, you know, I did. But yeah, I, I, I keep the calm because I, th I could show you an email probably at home. And these people wrote in because you know we one, got one guy that screams very loudly on the air, and people don't like that. And one of the reasons I'm calm. This has been going on for years. This email I got the other day after that storm. This guy said, uh, this lady said that yelling and screaming on the air just about scared my two grandkids to death. And so, part of it, so through the years, I've had, I don't know how many parents or grandparents bring the kids or grandkids out and say, this child is terrified of the weather, can you help us? And so we go through all the equipment, and look at us, look how old we are, we have been blown away, and all that we go, routine we go through, and it, it really helps them. But that's been created by the people who get on television and holler and scream. That's reason you'll see me so, well, the other night, <laughs> One of our guys was just, just our new was just screaming bloody murder and Gary, Gary, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I go, yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Go ahead. You just you have to do that because you get caught up in it. Now, uh, I, I can tell you a funny story about a guy who worked at Channel Four. They, they were at that point they were just crazy, loud, screaming, making up storms, scaring people. And so I went on this. I mean, I went on six o'clock news and I said, listen, folks, and I tell you what, I'm not going to do the sky is falling routine, but if it's falling, I think it's falling, I'll tell you. And that's all I said. This, I get off at 6.30, the phone rings. This guy over Channel 4, he said, he cussed me at first, and he said, don't you ever use my name on the air. And I said, I didn't, I didn't, uh, well, I'll see, I use Chicken Little. I didn't, all I said is, uh, you know, I don't think, I'm not going to use this guy's following routine. I'm not going to do the Chicken Little routine. I said, I didn't use your name. But, uh, it was. So things like that are very frustrating. And the thing is, a lot of people believe there's a lot of hype in, in the weather business. Uh, the, they call it hype and propaganda, and it's, it, I, just, I think there's something fundamentally wrong to intentionally mislead the audience. Is there something wrong with that approach? And it's done not only in this market, but other markets. It's, it's not right. It's, uh, gosh, it's, I think it's unethical and possibly immoral to do that. And, uh, but it's still done anyway. It's, they're all trying to make a profit, but sometimes it's just outrageous. Well, how do you unwind after <laughs> an event like that? Well, I, you know, like the other night, I, I stood on my feet for six hours, and uh, you, there's a lot of adrenaline, but when it's over, and, that, and that's six hours, and that's no water, no bathroom. You just, and of course, when it's over, you're real thirsty, and you got to go to the bathroom. But uh, normally, uh, you, we hang around while afterwards, we talk about what happened, what we could have done better, and then we, we, I go home and my wife is always up waiting on me and we'll sit down and talk about it and she'll tell me what she thought and, and get to bed. Like the other night we left here, I don't know what time it was, about, uh, I don't know, midnight or one, something like that, but get to bed two or three, 
you know, a lot of times you have storms the next day. But it's, it's you just got to talk to it. Used to, I'd, I couldn't sleep. I'd get home and I'd just twitch and go on because of, I guess, the adrenaline. But now I can pretty well, hey, it's a storm, not all that bad, or a guy, you know, not, got a lot of people, a lot of people may be injured in this thing, it's, but you get by it. When the May 3rd, 1999 tornado that killed about 40 and injured 700 or so, that, that was really something because I left here two or three in the morning, we still didn't know. And I had said that, and I said, you're not supposed to tell people this. I said, you people in Moore can move, to, should move to a place of safety or get below ground, get below ground right now. And you're never supposed to get in your car and escape a storm. If they hadn't, though, there'd have been hundreds more dead. Uh, Severe Storms Lab did a study and said, and everybody did great on the warnings that day. Severe Storms Lab said if the warnings hadn't been, if the warnings hadn't been as good, there would have been, they, I think they calculated 700 fatalities. But they got in their trucks, and they got in their cars, and they took off. And uh, fortunately, people listened and they got out. But you would have thought I'd shot the Pope. I mean, the, the, the tax, email, uh, just awful. But all I know is I did the right thing. Mm -hmm. And because, uh, you know, for years, and it was, a, hopefully we'll never have another event. And it probably won't like that when I'm on the air, but uh, another big one will come. But for years, they've heard tornado warning Oklahoma County, all residents continue with tornado regression, stay with News 9, we'll keep you advised. And that's been used thousands of times, and usually nothing happens. And this sucker was happening. It was big, it was mean. At one point, it was uh, a mile wide, and you can see it going through the power lines. It's just going pow, 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 pow. And you're like, whoa! And I remember Val Cash said, and he's up still, what he says, uh, Gary, it's going in a bad direction. And the next thing he said, Gary, it's so big, I can't get it in my viewfinder. And he was quite a ways from it. It was Titanic. It was just, you know. It was amazing, but it was a that was a learning experience because we've gone through several years of some, not a lot, and then here comes '99 and on you '99, know, that May third, uh, you know what it looked like the day before? It looked like uh, a severe thunderstorm, a few tornadoes. This is what it looked like, nothing more. And uh, the morning looked the same way to everybody, and then all of a sudden in the afternoon, it just literally exploded everywhere. We normally have about 53 tornadoes in Oklahoma per year. We had 60 in our viewing area one day. 60. You get his point. There they go. And every time we go, there's, I think it's five, and there may be four, but I think it's four or five main trunk lines bringing electricity into Oklahoma City. The, the tor various tornadoes went through, went through all but one of them. And when you go through those big power lines, this place, and the lights go off and buzzer is vroom, vroom, and you get now. I look back and look at those tapes, and the guys working with Jerry Dalrymple, you hear Jerry go, get us on the air, get us on the air, and got people running every which direction. And because, you know, there was tornadoes south, there was right out here, right over there. And they, you know they went on for they went from four o'clock in the afternoon to after midnight. It was unbelievable, but that was a learning. You'd think after all those years because I've been a long time then, and then you think through those years you've learned everything and God you, you realize you learn something new every time. Uh, and, you know it's just every tornado is a little bit different. They kind of you know they have a life cycle just like a human. It's shorter, but they uh, they they behave a little bit differently. Uh, they last do different things, they turn right, they turn left, they don't turn, and all of them are a little bit different. It's kind of, you know, you, know, you be out in a crowd and you say, how can there be so many different people? Look so different. Well, tornadoes are pretty much that way. On camera, they may all look the same. But uh, everything is a learning process in this business. Uh, it's, <laughs> over, your, over your career, has that been the storm? Yeah. On May 3rd? One? May 3rd, 99 was, was the was storm. The it was storm the perfect three. storm as far as uh, tornadoes are concerned. And uh, it, you know, like at uh, the Storm Prediction Center, the early guy put out, he thought it was gonna be bad and all that stuff. The next shift comes on, like at, at 11, they come out and say it's not gonna be a big deal. Mm -hmm. And then later they said it's gonna be a big deal. It just meant that no one really knew. I mean, it just until it really started happening, because you know, we had high clouds over us, uh, cuts the radiation from the sun, the dry line was way out west, and, but the upper winds were just got suddenly favorable and it was, it was unbelievable. Uh, yeah, it, it was the storm, and there was so many. There was a tornado near Chickasha, Val Kasser, uh, Mike, Mike, uh, Mike Armstrong was on. He took a picture and sent it to me. We were, we were the first ones, by, by the way, to ever send pictures over cellular telephone here, too. Well, it was always out of necessity. Uh, but anyway, I said, send me the picture, send me the picture. He sends me a picture, and this is 99. Send me a picture, and there's this giant tornado, and there's one rotating around the side that is about the size of an average Oklahoma tornado. I, I'm thinking. 
And uh, right at that point, I knew we had something really bad because it is most most big storms may cycle a couple times, produce a, produce a tornado, weaken, produce a tornado, weaken, and gone. This thing, time it got to um, uh, Chickasha, it is it was cycling for about I don't know fourth or fifth time, and the Titanic satellite tornado coming around, and then. You got a north of Chickasha, we're watching it live. That's what working in the weather office is great. You got video, you got electronic stuff, you got all the radars. And it got up there uh, southwest of Ridge Creek and it was gone. It just, and I'm looking at it, and I swear in 60 seconds it came back, and that's when it was a mile wide. It was, God, it was just unbelievable. And then, you know, tornado warnings here. These, uh, there were big tornadoes everywhere. There's one that went up through Logan County, uh, west of Stillwater, two miles wide. I mean, the Titanic. Uh, there are people up there that never found their mobile homes or any part of them. So yeah, that was the day. And so the day after that, I got up the next morning, you know, afraid to hear how many people had been killed getting in their cars and running for shelter, but that didn't happen to any of them. So people were killed in their cars, but not the ones down in the war. Uh, God, it was, it was a monster. <laughs> uh, so that was a storm. We've had a lot of blizzards. You know, I missed the... I missed the Christmas blizzard. I couldn't. I was in California. I couldn't believe it. The winds gusting to 50, then 55, then 60, then 65. Heavy snow, blowing snow. I'm going. And I'm not there. I couldn't believe it because I love snow. And uh, so, but I've been in a lot of other blizzards. Uh, ice storms. You know, Benton. We have ice storms, and you know, unfortunately, with the ice storms, power goes out. That one big one we had. Uh, power was out in southeastern Oklahoma. Was it? Some of those rural areas, five or six months. It was just. It was just so. I have, I've been in them all, it seems like. We've even had a, a tropical storm since I've been here. Aaron, I've got a year, not that many years ago. Uh, everything's happened. Do you have a safe room at your house? Yeah, I do have a safe room at my house. <laughs> Didn't have it for years. <laughs> the standard line I had was, they say, somebody say, hey, do you, you have a safe room? I said, I'm always at work, I don't need one. But my wife got kind of tired of that. <laughs> We're going, we don't have one here. Uh, we had a tornado pass over the station in 03, it was 03, about uh, 10 o'clock at night, and it touched down. You look at the intersection right over here, just northeast, is, and they rated about 155 miles an hour, and it, man, my eyes were watching so badly. Uh, and it came over the station. It was, there were no gentlemen that night, because it was every person for themselves. Bow Southwest was tornadoes intensifying rapidly along 63rd Street, a mile from us. And we're so busy going tornado warning, blah, 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 and Val said, Gary, it's coming to the station. Crap. We were so busy. I mean, I said, get everybody out of here, and it was just a stampede. And uh, because where we take shelter, there's not room for everybody, and you have to stand in there. Like, you know, the penguins all get together? That's what they look like. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a pretty wild night. And it was so loud in here that the wind noise, it was... Jed dove, uh, whatever meter I was, Jed dove under the desk and there's these rear ends sticking out and I go, Jed, that's not going to do it. <laughs> so he took off. Uh, it was wild. It was just wild. So we've had some times like that. In, uh, we had a tornado come across here uh, in 98. It was coming across Lake Hefner and it was biblical. Supercells coming across Lake Hefner and the water, it was, it was up there, the water's rising up off the lake and feeding into this this huge thunderstorm. And we're watching it on tower cam and storm tracker shots. I'm going, holy crap, look at this thing. And it comes across and produces several small tornadoes in the village and Nichols Hills. And boom, you just see the plumes go up, boom, boom, boom. And then it's going right over here, and, and somebody yelled, Tower is coming down. I went, Which tower? It was a radio tower, WKY. And we looked at that on our monitor, on our camera, and the water from that little, there's a little lake. God, it was just, it was coming up and just streaming into this thing. And it went across there, it went right to the parking lot, Channel 5. Uh, but it was, so we had a few like that, which are really, and you know, this, you'd have to love this business, because it's, it's, something like that happens, it is really, really wild. You don't want anybody to get hurt, but when something like that happens, it's, it's something you remember the rest of your life. Crazy stuff. So the experiences in weather have been wild, the experiences with people have been wild, with promotions have been wild, and the station relationships sometimes been a little bit on the wild side. Because we're all trying to win and do the best job we can, and sometimes we don't, we don't agree on the methods. I'm kind of bouncing around here, but uh, no, that's okay. And so you started storm trackers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Is there a difference between trackers and chasers? 
Well, we used to call them, excuse me, we used to call them chasers, but that implies that they have to chase the storm. Ours are trackers. They plot out where the storm is going to be. They're going to track it, like you're going to track something, and they get themselves in position. In position. The, the, the reason we use a different name in reality is, is promotion-wise. We don't want our people to be called chasers because everybody else calls themselves chasers. And so we just call them storm trackers. And they, let me tell you, uh, they're darn good. Uh, let me see. One of the, the minimum time they have with us, on one, one guy I think he's been like 10 years. Val's been with us 20-some years. These guys are highly expensive, and girls, because two of them are husband-wife teams. And the wives, I'm telling you, those two trucks are the, the brains behind it. The guys just drive and go, wow, oh, look at that storm over there. And the gal's running the computer and sending the video back, and it's a complex process. And uh, every vehicle must have two people in it at all times, one to drive, one to shoot. Uh, it's uh, it's, a, it's a quite an operation. It's pretty exciting stuff. Long answer to your question, yeah, we call them storm trackers, it's just to be a little bit different. And now across the country, and the people have picked it up. We got a radar we put in one time. I, you always think, try to think of a name. I said, let's just call it Doppler 9000, because no one's going to say Doppler 10,000. Well, they did, and then it was Doppler 12,000. And uh, yeah, it's hard to come up with a name that you can promote that someone doesn't grab. Uh, we, we, we call our guys storm trackers. Well, Channel 4 started calling one of their pieces of equipment storm tracker. It just it creates confusion. It's smart marketing, guerrilla marketing on their part, mm -hmm. uh, but it just really makes you mad. You spend all this money and try to do things right, and you know, someone steals your name, whatever. But you know, as I mentioned, life's a decision. Life is a process. Um, when computers first came along, and I, we were trying to figure out, you know, we ended up making the, the projection that looked like a racetrack at first, and then it's the fan that goes out and gives you time to arrive. Well, I found a kid at OU could pr program. There weren't many people in those days. You could do that. So I brought him in. I said, this is what I want. Drew it out. And I said, can you do this? Yeah, I can do that. And he pro programmed it in basic. You know, and it worked. And we've got, i got a video I can show you if I can find it. The first time we used it, we set a tornado. It would be hit 8 at 433. This is not the one that killed the people. This is a different one. 433. And anyway, it hit 8 or near 8. Uh, and there's uh, Mr. Jelnaker's down there with a cameraman after it's over. And he's got this farmer. And he said, you know, well, Gary England said that tornado would hit 433. So I want you to look at that clock over there against that wall that was in that barn. It said 433. You can't buy a promotion like that. Uh, it was just, it was just crazy, uh, crazy times. But that uh, kid that programmed that, so it was successful. Came to work two, three weeks later, he was gone. He had taken the program and he'd gone to, he was up in Tulsa trying to sell it, which he did. Uh, but we found out then that he, he owned the program because we didn't have an agreement with him. If you write a program, it's yours unless you have a document. <laughs> so. We had to bring in another program, and we couldn't show them the code. We say, see that screen? That's the result we want. And I think our chief engineer was a girl. She, she ended up reprogramming it for us. Uh, learn something there. You learn, learn as old as I get, that's a long time ago. As old as I am, I still learn every day about something I'm just totally surprised about. I couldn't believe that kid ran off and took the program. I want to know what you how how you managed to learn all the pronunciations of the counties in Oklahoma. <laughs> well, I didn't do it in high school. I was supposed to. You know, you're supposed to learn the 77 counties. Potawatomi. Potawatomi. Yeah. Uh, Ofuski. You know, uh, all those. That Pushmataha. I love those. You know, uh, I, it's just by reputation. I couldn't say them at first. There's there's still three towns I have difficulty with when I, and they come up on the screen. And I will not say them. Uh, I'd have to look and see which ones they are, but uh, is it Kogar or Cougar? I always, I mean, there's one down the river down there. Uh, radar, anyway, there's three of them that I can't, I panicked on the same wrong. When I was first on, Tornado, tornado was near, near Lukiba, not west here. I called it Lukiba. And really, there's only like nine families that lived there, and most of them called that night, just raising Cain, that I mispronounced the name. So I've been pretty cautious ever since. Uh, but I love doing the Pushmataha and Potawatomi, and, and it's, it's kind of fun uh, now that I can actually say them. And I still garble them occasionally. Well, you've probably been to every county then if you did all these. Yeah, well, our, our, our viewing area is you just take a line from uh, west of west of Stillwater over to past Cushing, line from Cushing down to Okima, 
uh, down to Ada. So we're about the western two-thirds of the state, so we never went east there. We went to Durant once, did a show there. But uh, it, we, it's like it's something we've been everywhere. Uh, well, at one point there, we had like two uh, two airplanes, and uh, we flew to Woodward because they always we always do this. Usually, a lot of them we do during ratings. Get out there and try to get, get them to watch you and all that stuff. So we flew out to to Woodward, a passel of us, and it was at the fairgrounds. And there was like two or three thousand people there. It was just it was just crazy, and they were just so excited, you know, because here comes these TV people. And we do the show, and we're in such a hurry because we've got to get back by 10 o'clock, and we the show was over, and we signed some deals, and we jumped in the car and roared back to the airport out there at Woodward, and we get the airplane and realize we left the pilot at the show. And just crazy stuff. Another, when we were going to Durant, we had a Barron's aircraft. We were wide wingspan. I wasn't on this flight, but this is what happened. And uh, I thought it was eight or ten people, but we called her Big Mary. Big, tall girl. Big, tall. Gosh, she was six-something. Fun. Well, we didn't know she'd get airsick, and she got a little sick. So the pilot, Leroy, he said, "Well, come up here." I had this other guy get out of the coat. He said, "You sit in that co-pilot seat." And he said she got put her hand on his shoulder and just threw up right down his neck. And he's on well close to final approach. Oh, it's just now we have really one bad twist or so. You, I guess you call this learning humility. We have all these successes. So we go to Durant, because we're just on the cable down there maybe a month, and they decide we should go, somebody decides we should go to Durant and do a Twister show. We go down there, and uh, one of the camera crews told me later, he said, they knew we were in trouble as soon as they got there, because they, what they, he said what they do, they'll go to a store and say, hey, where's that Twister show? And, and somebody said, oh, it's down so-and-so. Well, he did that, and he said to this guy to some store, he said, where's that Twister show? And that guy said, is that a wrestling match? And he said he knew right then we were in trouble. Uh, we had seating for 1,500, and we were lucky we had 15 people out there. And <laughs> I mean, and it was, we had all this expense, all this stuff, and people didn't know who we were, and they don't want, they had been watching us long enough, and there was no one there. And I remember Mitch was going to be the anchor with me, and we looked out there, and Mitch said, We can't go out there. He said, Mitch, we have to go out there. And, uh, 15 people, whatever it was, we presented it like it was 15,000. Just when they did the whole show, but you know, it'll, it'll humble you sometimes. And it, it's some that's a hard. Our line the guy was, I was always working with Jerry Dalrymple. We having a show, whether it's Norman or wherever it was. Said, listen, we're going to drive by, and if there's nobody there, we're going on. <laughs> you guys can handle it. But most of the shows were really, really successful. Great fun. Anyway, they said. If we charge them, we wouldn't be anybody there. You see, you have to keep those things in perspective. I tell the kids, that's great stuff. All these people show up. You charge them, they're not going to show up. So you just have to just keep that in mind. I think it's all part of it. A lot of changes. A lot of changes. In the next five to ten years, what do you see coming well, down the pike? Well, in the next five, ten years, I think you know we're, we're going more quickly to uh, wireless devices of all types. A lot of people get their weather uh, that way. I still believe during major weather events, people are going to want to watch the person that they've been with all those years, who they have confidence and they feel safe with. Because if you know, you're faced by a quarter mile or a mile wide tornado, I don't think you're going to be real happy just looking at you know, your, your screen or your forecast. Now, we're getting more and more video on the cell phones, and maybe eventually it'll be that. I think it's a little difficult to, to really connect with a person when they got to have a real small screen, but I just see more and more wireless more and more weather out there. There's so much weather information available, you know, it's just all my friends are experts, you know, my family, they're experts, you know, and somebody say, what's the weather? Somebody pulls it, before I can even move, they pull it, okay, it's going to be 55 in the south, 10 to 20. I'm, God. But that's what I see, the more and more advances along those lines. Uh, you know, I don't think regular television will ever go away, but it's going to change a lot more, I think. Uh, but when Dwayne Harm was here, God, it's been 20 years ago, he was a general manager. And he went to something in, in New York City, in Washington, and he said, he came back, he said, uh, this business is changing rapidly, you're not going to recognize it. He said 10 years, but it took about 20 to hardly recognize it. And it's changed drastically. Uh, the kids still going into weather at OU and all these meteorology schools across the country that want to be on television, it's not going to happen. But they're yet to just put so many of those kids in those classes, and uh, they've got the dream, but it's not, not going to happen for them. I tell them, you know, uh, learn, the, learn, the, learn the meteorology, 
take the, the communications classes, learn programming, get some business courses. Uh, you know, when I graduated, I was proud I had math and meteorology and I couldn't get a job, really. And my friend who went to business school got a job just like that. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating. I, I hate that it's changing so quickly, but it is what it is. How do you keep up? Oh. How do you keep up? Well, you know, most everything now is put uh, online, so we stay pretty well connected that way. Uh, we have conferences every year. We get the ones for radar and severe storms and climate and all that stuff, and uh, we just go through and get the Arctic because they're pertinent to us. And, uh, and we pretty well know much what we're, well, what we're doing, what's, what's good, the research going on, and so much of it comes uh, much at OU, the, the government guys down there. They're really fantastic. I mean, they've, they, they come out with, you know, they have new programs, new models. Uh, the models are a little crazy. Uh, how many we have? Six, eight, ten, twelve. The problem is they're all usually different. And these kids come out of school now, it's the model this, the model that, the model this. And I'll say to them, mm, okay, other than the model, why did you make this decision to put rain out on the sixth day? <laughs> they, just, they just can't, they can't, they can't respond. It's really, it's, from me, it's kind of terrifying. What happens, they're, everything's done for them by computer now. And I've always felt if you're going to forecast the weather, whether it's tornadoes or snow or hot weather, you got to see what's in your backyard. you got to look at the observations around you. Is there anything that fixes it? Because, you know, we miss nowadays. There was snow went across the state last night. It wasn't forecast. Uh, so, but the kids, are just, it's just model this, model that. So I really, I have fun. When they see me coming, you see them start backing up because I'll pick one of them. Why, other than a model, did you, what, what's the meteorological reasoning for this? It's really fun. Because the model said so is what they'll say. It, so when you retire, you're going to go teach. <laughs> oh well, I'm, I might. You know, I, there's a. I don't know what you call it a meteorology class, but like a maybe a reality class. <laughs> you know, of what what work and life and meteorology and television is all really about. Uh, the girl we have out here, she'll do well. She'll get. Uh, you know, she may stay here. She may go someplace else. Uh, but we have. The world is filled full of meteorology graduates. Bachelors, masters, and PhDs. There's so many of them, and they had the dream, and not going to happen. I just there's no way. Uh, it's unfortunate, but I stay update, uh, updated. Now, the, uh, the new kids coming out of school, if we, get, we use interns from OU. They're a good source. What news going on? So we use them. In turn, we let them get great experience here. Now we got a girl who comes down from OU during severe weather. She's really good. She she doesn't know it, but she's getting an education that nobody else gets. I mean, real time tornado activity and how it's covered properly, and really what goes into it. Because we discuss the forecast, where it's going to happen, what the parameters are missing, or is it ideal? All that stuff. And she's been in on that. She's uh, and she probably could get too. She, I think she's from Duncan, Oklahoma. And uh, the guys I got out here, they're all good. They're all smarter than me. Which is good. I always, I always maintain you surround yourself with good people, then it makes you look a lot better. <laughs> it's another fact of life, at least from the Gary's perspective. Uh, what else? Yeah. See, here's one of the papers. Tropical extrapolation. Tropical extrapolation. You say interacts associated with the 30 to 60 day oscillation and its impact on medium extended range prediction. And most of these, or a lot of you can't, you can hardly read, but some of them are quite good. You take time to do. Some yeah, I'll pick out the titles that I need. I think I need, and I'll read them. Uh, if they get totally theoretical, I don't need that. I, I need the facts. I need the operational research. If this happens to these factors, then what happens? It's not six o'clock, is it? No, but we can round, wrap it up. It's five after five. Well, I'm, I'm still all right. You got anything else we need to cover? Well, well, I usually end up with, if you don't have anything else, my last question is usually when history is written about you, what would you like for it to say? Oh, I'd like for it to say that uh, uh, life has been a, a great trip for me. Uh, I met and married a wonderful girl. Uh, I got a wonderful daughter and I got two granddaughters, so I'm out in Leopard. And uh, maybe what's written is I'm just really happy that I came along, came along at the right time in the right place, because <laughs> that's a lot of it. I think so often 
unless you're exceptionally brilliant, so often it's right, right time, right place. Are you willing to do this type of thing? Uh, but I think that's what I'd like, you know. All the stuff we've done here, or I've done, somebody else would have done it somewhere down the line. So, you know, uh, so my daughter was uh, com competing for something and she didn't get it. I don't know what it was. And she, and I, and she was really upset this years ago. She was crying, and she said, "But Daddy, you've won all those plaques and all this." I said, "Molly, those don't mean a thing. You know, they just don't. So, so many of them are political anyway. You know." And I said, "Don't mean it. It was hard to explain to her because you know my my world has been when this do that. You know, when television wave, and then she lost what she was trying to do, and it was it was a difficult time. She never now she understands it. I got these up for show." <laughs> <laughs> and not for me. Now I do like that one, Friday Night in the Big Town, the movie Twister. The Twister. Mm -hmm. And uh, Oklahoma Weather, that's the first little book I did, 1972 or 3. And uh, sold that at the fairgrounds for two dollars. <laughs> Some guy in Stillwater. Him. Jim Hale in 1992 drew that. I think that's just fantastic. We're off to see the doctor. And when I was up there giving a talk with Doc Castor at some function, and he had drawn that. There's Spike. We had Spike the pig. That was my pig. He got more uh, invitations to go to schools than we did eventually because <laughs> if the kids would read 10,000 books, the principal would have to kiss the pig. So it was great stuff. So that, that's great. This is a good friend of mine who draws these funny things for me. That was the first book, and that was the, the movie thing. The movie. And uh, that was an interesting experience, but they never did call back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, did you expect them? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I'll just tell you a quick story about that. When we went up this around the time, as I recall, the, the Oklahoma City bombing, but uh, we went up to do a, they asked us to come up to a safety program for the, the crew and the cast of the movie Twister. So we go up to Ponk City and Pretty easy to do a safety sh deal and show tapes and all that stuff. But at the end of my talk, to take the responsibility somewhat off of the companies, I always say to the employees, I said, let me tell you, if you're in the field and you feel threatened, you have the right to make a decision to walk off, get in your car and leave and seek safety. You know, you have that right. And uh, Jan Devon, the director, didn't like that. And there must have been 150 people this room. When I said that, you, you have the right to walk off the set if you feel threatened. He jumped up and yelled, you can't say that. And Kathleen Kennedy then jumped up. You know, she's the one that did Schindler's List and all that. She jumped up and said, he can too. And, and, she, and Yana Bond is a great a great director and fiery. And she said, he can too. You shut up and sit down. And so he sat down. And I thought, well, there goes my career. Uh, but later I worked with him and we did some stuff out in Hollywood, did some audio taping and stuff, and he was just great. So he didn't think anything. He must yell at people all the time. But it was a fun time. I was out there in the studio, and I realized that they take, <clears throat> you have to do digital audio looping, is that what it's called? And they throw the movie up on the screen, and then you just repeat whatever the, the tape said. And But I, I'm there, and I'm watching uh, Bill do his part. And they said, okay, we need to, what you need to do on this one is just, you know, you're out of breath. So he dropped down, did about 20 push-ups. He jumped back up and he yelled, it's too late, it's already here. You know, and, he, and the movie comes up on this giant wall. And then he does his thing. And then Jamie Gertz does her something when she was in a car. She was a little psychologist. And there was, uh, who else was there? Somebody else, I don't know who had been. And I've said, and I finally realized I'm next. I'm going, I'm next. Uh, but I went down there and I was really... I was terrified, I was afraid of him because he had been all over me at that punk city. But he was great. And he said, you gotta help us make this real. I said, well, before we do that, I said, you know, it's not normal for tornadoes to come from Muskogee to, <laughs> to Bedford. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, that, it took a little while to get all that straight in. But I helped him rewrite the script on the, 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 the tornadoes and the st stuff that it does. And, and then I did my little part there, you know, with the, the digital audio. And uh, it was a great experience. We went to, and of course, we're always promoting. We went to Chinese. Where's it where they've got the handprints and all that stuff? Yeah. yeah. We went there with our cameras and everything to shoot me standing out there. And all these uh, Orientals came up and they were wanting my autograph. They had no idea, man, who I was. It was great fun, though. 
but like I said, they never called back, so I kind of forgot about that. Uh, let's see, what else? You know, I just, you know, you look at all those experiences, they've just been fantastic, and I've already been blessed. And you won the Edmund Murrow Award? Your team Edward R. Murrow, yeah. Your yeah. team did? Yeah, uh, where is it? Uh, Edward R. Murrow, yeah. We won the national award, which is really, really great. I don't, I may have that at home. Some of them I kind of protect like that. Yeah, you know, that was a national competition for best, uh, best, actually classified as best breaking news, but it was, it's kind of the perfect day. Stationary front, the south of Enid, ran over, had its tornado near Stillwater too. Ran over to Stillwater. And uh, one of those days we weren't really expecting much. So I walked out, I was uh, at the Arts Festival, uh, just the one over here in Paseo. I walked out of that and about one o'clock and I could see towers going up through the, the clouds. And took off for work and there and that's where our guys and gals were. Everybody left and they were here with me. We piled in there, sent the helicopter up here, all the storm trackers and this tornado after tornado we started forming and just going along this front from the northwest, west, northwest, to east, southeast, and it was just perfect video, you know, it was just, it was just like a Walt Disney movie, you know, the camera's there, and, and the helicopter from the ground, they had all these storm trackers, and they'd bounce from tracker to tracker, you know, saying, hey, yeah, I'm right here, and I've got this, and blah, 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 and it was just, it was just, it was magnificent, I had very little to do with it, you know, just except for getting them out there, because, you know, that's the old story about the blind dog and finding an acorn sometime, yeah, well, the, you know, it was that it was that way. Well, it wasn't that way. It was just so easy because uh, all the stuff was there and it was well covered. And and uh, you know, and we entered it and talk about surprised. I was really surprised. Uh, but it was it was great. It was just, it was a great honor. Uh, but you know, you never know on those things. Who's you know? You don't know when you enter. But when I've gone back and look at that entry, it was it was nice. It was. It was stunning. It's a tornado went through a pig farm, and uh, it, was, it was pretty wild. Didn't ever hit any houses, but it hit the pig farm. And you know, I made a lot of jokes about when pigs fly. <clears throat> but uh, then we found had tornado warnings all over the Lake Carl Blackwell. But it was it was a long afternoon. It was a Saturday afternoon, but it was nice to win that. That was that's probably about the one I'm most proud of. We got all kinds of stuff hanging around. Uh, I don't know what old, one of the neatest things that's been happening recently is Marty Logan, he really saved a lot of lives in the Woodward Tornado last year, and uh, it's it's compelling stuff. I don't know, we entered that. It was, all the power's off in Woodward, and so he's talking on us, I don't know how he's hitting it, but he's talking to us on the cell, and we put him just southwest of Woodward, it's right, right before midnight, this rather large tornado's moving toward Woodward, and he's the only one out. The emergency manager guy had been told to go back to bed, you know, go out and go home, and that sucker's gonna kill six people, and, and uh, but he walked it through town. He's a former fireman, darn thing, and that's the guy in the red shirt. And he was being honored uh, the other day in Woodward, and he's gonna be honored in a week or so at the state capitol. But he just he walked it through town, and he gave the streets is coming this way, this way. And we trained those guys, stay calm. And you hear him say, you "Gotta stay calm, you gotta stay calm." And uh, he go, "Oh, oh, oh, gotta stay calm." And you know, he found people, you know. But he did unbelievable. He did. I couldn't have done it. But he he walked that thing in town. Walked it right across town, and and he was telling people, you know, uh, you know, call people, you know, let them know what's going on. There's a lot of people going to bed, and uh, but that that's been exciting for him to get all that stuff. Because you know he's worked for us now almost 20 years. <clears throat> but he was, and before that Woodward tornado, he was really quiet, really. But now you know he's gotten some uh, recognition. And it's just been great. He's just blossomed into a very verbal guy and wonderful, warm, and and he doesn't have a suit, so he's buying a suit to go to the state capitol. I said, Marty, be yourself. Wear your starch jeans and white shirt, you know, whatever. But uh, so that's been some of the good things that's happened. Uh, like with him. Uh, I don't know what else. Edward Murrow Award is a good one. Now it's interesting that year the RTNDA local. I think that's what it was. Win win. I think it's the one. But then we win the national with the same entry. <laughs> Politics. <laughs> uh, well, you know, you look at uh, there's there's off, been an awful lot of good. A few bad things happen. Usually a lot of good. Uh, and it's 
I say it's bad. You know, a lot of it has to do with you know, personality conflicts. You get people in a small office back here and they don't like each other. It's really miserable. Uh, but usually you get that settled one way or another. Now, you know, with the HR departments, most of my years there wasn't even an HR department. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you get your rear end hauled upstairs very quickly if you even, they be perceived as saying the wrong time. And, I, and that kind of makes me happy I'm getting out of this before long. Uh, it's, it's become so restrictive, you know, what you can do and what you can say. And uh, we had a lot of good times when it was looser. We used to have parties back here in Studio B that would probably top anything you'd see in Hollywood because in those days only three stations, money to spend, all kinds of bands and food and drink and it was just amazing. It was, uh, we had, uh, well we'd have a premier party at some theater and the guy was just, it was just, uh, it was a dream. And uh, I was just busy doing everything, I didn't know how great it was, you know? Yeah. But it was uh, super times, been super times. I hope uh, it'll continue for a while at least. Uh, I see a picture over there of Tom Mahoney. Tom Mahoney was here in 1972, 74. And Tom just is retiring June 1st. Been somewhere up in uh, Michigan. Dennis Smith, I see a picture of him over there. And he was, on, he was here for many years and he went to the Weather Channel and I think he retired recently. Uh, Two of the guys worked here, chief meteorologist in Kansas City, and they got a bunch of scattered all over the country. And it's always good to hear from them and see them and that type of thing. But it's a di it's a different world than it was just a few years ago. They'll be asking you when you're retired, retiring. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know. Well, my contract goes to October of 2016. But my on air this time I'm doing two shows a day now. This time next year I'll be doing one show. In the last two years I don't do any shows. They just Paying me to keep my mouth shut, I guess. <laughs> to do weather events? Well, I don't even know if I'll be doing those. You know, I, I think they got to get on with the future, and they've hired this, this kid, or maybe he's not a kid, and he's been, he's been on television 20 years. But uh, so, you know, you got to, things got to change. So I love it, but there are a lot of days I'd just be happy staying at home. <laughs> so I'll be out here before long, I'm sure. Uh, it's just you can't work forever, but it is great fun. You know, it just there's something about it, and I, you know, probably more than anything else, I love doing my shows because if something funny happens or you know whatever it is, if I know I'm making people at home smile a little bit, I know I've done something good because hey, they can get weather anywhere, you know, they get numbers anywhere, so yeah, they got to be your friends, so that's that's the fun part, and I don't think I'll miss the tornadoes at all. It is an adrenaline rush. But I just don't think I will miss them that much. Uh, Molly and her husband, and kids live in California, so I've got to get out there and spend some time with them. And uh, I'm, I'm probably not going to miss it very much. <laughs> Is that sad or not? No, that's just a, a life well lived. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so I'm going to put it this way: it will be it the dates I gave you, or sooner, because I've got an option to go take myself off the air if I want to. Because David was down there, he said, Gary, when it gets to the point you say it's not any fun, he said, well, you can take yourself off there and we'll continue to pay you as if you still work here. So, which is pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, he's been a good family to work with. They, they, they're out of Muskogee. You always call it the Green Bean Factory. <laughs> Daddy started out in, I guess, green beans and corn. And I don't know what it was, in uh, Griffin syrup. and. I always kept some of those stuff around home just in case they dropped by. I could put it out and know I traded with them. <laughs> uh, but a good bunch of people. Uh, what else? Because I knew David when he was out here with his dad, and David was about that tall. And Governor Bellman, and you know, Marine veteran, all of that. You know, great guy, and very quiet, very inwardly focused. <laughs> I had never met him, and we were doing the Red Bud Run. You know, years ago, and I run up beside him, Governor Bellman, how are you? Nice, nice to meet you. And he looked at me and he went, eh. <laughs> That's all he said and just ran on. He, he, was, he was running? Yeah. He well, was he was, far. I think he was walking, and, and uh, I was doing that slow trot, you know, I trotted up her thinking, he said, hey, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> Put you in your place. Uh, you know, Governor Nye was uh, always great. 
and uh, got to know him really well. David Bourne has always been super. And uh, so most, you know, a lot of those people I've known like that have really, really been nice people, good people. So I occasionally will send Bourne a note. And he's been so good through the years, he'll send me a note, especially after a real tough time. He's, he'll say something like, Gary, when I was governor, I always listened to you. Yeah, he just yeah, he knew what to say. He's a, he's a politician and you know all that stuff. Now Burns, I can't tell all the things I know about Burns Hargis. So, <laughs> <laughs> would you do it all again? Absolutely. You know what? I wouldn't change. You know, there's been some bad times. I wouldn't change anything because I've always believed if you change one thing, you may change everything. The whole thing could change by just one little decision to do something else or whatever. Uh, yeah, I'd do it again, uh, without a doubt. Great times. Lucky? Yeah. Very lucky. Very fortunate? Yeah. Yeah. And I've always had good people around me. That helps make a difference. But do it again? Absolutely. I'd start tomorrow if I could. <laughs> you, you seem to be proactive on various things, though. Always trying something new, trying... Yeah. to solve a problem before it's a problem. Well, and, I, and I've got lots of ideas, lots of things that probably people will develop in the future, things that we could be doing, but the money isn't there anymore to do those. Used to, well, on one of the deals that we were putting together was uh, we were working with a company that helped us build the, the first, his name is Monsoor, and he came by and I'd been, I didn't get to know him, and he came by and he said, Gary, tell me what you need, because he's a, he's a computer guy, and this is years ago. I said, you know, I, you know what I need? I need something where I can send a picture of those cellular telephones. And he put together this, and we'd done it while he was working on it. Roger Cooper, one of the anchors, had worked on it, and we were able to do it that way, and it was, it was great. But he worked and did all this stuff, and uh, he just, he was, and I forgot the point I was going to make with him. Uh, uh, oh, he talked about entre being entrepreneurial. Well, Julie is head of the engineering department, and I was head of weather, so he and I, Slip 1500 a month each out of our budgets to pay him to develop that software, to, which was really the forerunner of all the stuff you see today. And we still have the ponytail units back here. We got seven or eight of them that we use. And, but it was the idea that swept the country. But we, the money was there, so we just slipped it out and paid it to him. And so we'll do some great things. And other things, you know, the company actually paid for and knew they were paying for. Uh, when we got the, uh, started on that first operator, it was going to be $2.5 million, uh, $250,000, which is a lot. 78, that was a lot of money and a big risk for the company. And uh, so, but they, they knew they were paying for that. But a lot of these things we worked on, uh, you know, we did kind of like that. So, so many, I, I just, I think it's in the genes because things, ideas come to me and, and, and it works. Unfortunately, I never took any of them and built them in a big business. <laughs> oh, was, you probably could. I know one guy took the projection system because ours was pretty ugly and he came up with his own, and he became so rich, it's unbelievable. Got some patents and moved on that. Got patent. we, didn't, we didn't think about patents. We just wanted to do something better. So, whatever. Well, it serves the people of Oklahoma well. It really does. It's, uh, it's, done, it's done good for them. It really has. Uh, I'm sure there'll be other great things come up. You, know, you think everything's been done, but it hadn't. Like I said, we always met. We'd have Jerry and I'd have meetings, and said, like I said, it never was. Let's do something great today. It was how can we do this better? You know, we're making fools out of ourselves. You know, the the graphics weren't good, so you know the the weather maps, the radar maps are terrible. So I got I went down and bought nine U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey maps. They're huge maps. They're kind of like the Google Maps, but it's Coast and Geodetic Survey maps, and and I clipped them all off, and I. We got that rubber cement and cemented them all together and Jerry built a big frame of rollers on it. We called it the big map. And so we got serious. He'd say, you want me to get the big map? I'd say, hey, get the big map. We'd roll it out there and it was great. We had the highways and cities and they, they could zoom in on it. It was just as clear as Google Earth is except the, the relief and all that. And But that was just a matter of the graphics we have really are not very good. So let's try something else. So I did that and we used it for years. Uh, if you know. I think the key is looking for something that where you improve. You improve. How do you improve things? And we improved a lot of things, and some of the stuff we did didn't work very well. <laughs> God, but a lot did. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's amazing. All I can say is amazing times. I keep saying it over to so yeah. 
would I do it again? Yeah, it was a great life. Yeah, it's been a great life, and I hope I have more of it to live and, and away from here. Because, uh, you know, you, you marry this thing. You marry television if you're in weather. If you're in news, no. Weather you're married to. Got to be here. I usually, during storm weather, winter weather, I work every weekend. If I'm not here, I'm from home. Just trying to keep up. We, I send that, we, we send that weather updates, uh, weather outlooks, weather updates, weather priorities. And that's for everybody in the station that has, to, has a function in case something bad happens. They're aware of what the weather is. And so it's, it's continuous. And, uh, you know, I miss a lot of golf. I miss a lot of things. I miss almost everything that Molly did as a kid, uh, my daughter. But, uh, you know, but it's getting been good for her, too. So but I think I'm kind of anxious to hit the road, Jack. Well, when you do hit the road, will you be a spotter for some other? Yeah. No. You know, I don't, really like, I don't like storm chasing, storm tracking. I, I, you know, I d did it. And I'm just not real crazy about sitting in an empty field for hours. There's a photographer over here, I think a pretty famous photographer. Uh, I, don't, I don't think he's in business any longer, but he went with a bunch of storm trackers out to the Panhandle. And he told me later, he said, Gary, it was 3 a.m. and they ran slap out Oklahoma. There's no buildings. And he said, we're sitting there, and of course he was twice as old as all of them, drinking beer at 3 a.m. and slap out Oklahoma. He said, remember, think, what am I doing here? I'll never do this again. Because <laughs> usually on the storm chases, you hit about one out of ten times. Oh. Yeah. So, and you know, some years you don't hit any. Yeah. You know, at least keep a water gauge then, huh? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, if you don't have anything else, I will say thank you very much. And You're certainly welcome. And thank you for being the calm voice. Yeah, I appreciate this very water. much. <laughs> yeah. Trying to do the balancing act, but thank you very much. <laughs>